in 2017 compared to only 200 million for the Exim Bank in the United States. I look forward to working with you to make sure we reauthorize this very important agency and institute reforms that will strengthen it, uh, its ability to help American workers compete on the global playing field. I'm also looking forward to your testimony uh, with regard to global uncertainty, sanctions, international development, and the Bank Secrecy Act. Uh, thank you for being here. I yield back the balance of my time to the gentleman. Yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the subcommittee chair, Mr. Cleaver, for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, for appearing on this committee. Uh, and also, uh, although it's not said enough, thank you for uh, the service to our country. Uh, when you took this job, you, like m members of Congress, swore on an oath to faithfully defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Under these unusual times, the oath is being tested. It is my opinion that many of our critically important institutions are actually being threatened. I think this hearing is an opportunity for you to tell us about how you are holding on to these institutions. Hopefully, you will provide candid answers to questions on your role and decisions impacting our citizens and, frankly, the entire world. Decisions that include a dangerous and wrong-headed trade and tariff policy that reduce America's income at a rate of $1.4 billion each month, according to the Federal Reserve. The same policies the U.S. Chamber of Commerce says threaten 2.6 million American jobs. We will also have, uh, hopefully, a better understanding of how this administration decides to remove sanctions against Russia and North Korea. These two countries that have been identified in our unclassified worldwide threat assessment as primary threats to our national security. I look forward to uh, raising questions with you later. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, I want to welcome to the committee our witness, Mr. Stephen T. Mnuchin, Secretary of the Treasury. He has served in his current position since 2017. Mr. Mnuchin has testified before the committee on previous occasions, and I believe he does not need any further introduction. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. Secretary Mnuchin, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the committee, it is good to be here with you today to discuss the state of international financial system, the National Advisory Council on International Monetary and Financial Policies report to Congress, and key priorities of the Treasury Department. I am proud to report that President Trump's program of tax cuts, regulatory relief, and improved trade deals is resulting in the strongest economic growth for the American economy since 2005 and the best jobs market in generations. I would also just like to comment on opportunity zones, which are an important key component of the Tax Cuts and Job Act. They will help more Americans benefit from our strong economy. Opportunity zones offer capital gains relief for investments in businesses in distressed communities. We are seeing a great deal of enthusiasm for this policy all across the country because it will lead to revitalization and restore the promise of prosperity to more workers and families. The administration is making trade with our international partners a top priority. I urge all members of Congress to support the passage of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement, USMCA. It will create the highest standards ever negotiated to protect intellectual property rights of entrepreneurs, provide strong support for the small and medium-sized businesses, encourage manufacturing, and opening markets for American agricultural products. We are also making progress negotiating with China to rebalance our economic relationship, end unfair trade practices, open their economy to American companies, and protect our critical technology. We remain focused on several economic issues related to national security. We are implementing the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act, FIRMA. This legislation, which passed with overwhelming bipartisan support, modernizes the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, known as CFIUS, review process, and enhances CFIUS' ability to analyze transactions for national security risks, preserving our commitment to open investment environment. 
Treasury is combating the abuse of our financial system by rogue regimes, terrorist organizations, cyber criticals, and other illicit actors. The United States government and our international partners are putting unprecedented pressure on the illegitimate Maduro regime in Venezuela. We will continue to target this regime and support interim president Juan Guaido as he seeks to restore security and prosperity in his country. Treasury is also using its authority to combat human rights abuses and corruption. We are pleased that with many members of this committee have supported our sanctions and other actions, I assure you that the administration will continue to aggressively target malign actors all around the world. Turning to policy developments impacting international financial institutions, we are advancing reforms to more efficiently alleviate poverty and foster stability and growth in emerging markets. We are working constructively at the G7, the G20, the World Bank, the IMF, and other partners to foster debt transparency that will reduce the risks of crisis in developing countries. As you are aware, the IMF aims to conclude the 15th general review of quotas this year. We believe the overall resources are currently adequate for to accomplish its goals. We are beginning discussions with other shareholders on this issue. Finally, of particular note, we are requesting authorization for the funding of the World Bank's capital increase. In connection with this, we successfully negotiated a comprehensive reform package, including lending measure limits and future need to limit future capital increase and focus resources on poorer countries. We are also requesting authorization for the planned share purchase in the North American Development Bank with the goal of working more closely with Mexico to improve economic conditions. I look forward to your questions and discussing ways to create more jobs and more opportunities for hardworking American families. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Secretary Mnuchin, Chairman Neal requested the President's tax returns last week. Section 6103 of the Internal Revenue Code states that when the Committee on Ways and Means makes such a request, quote, the Secretary shall furnish any return or return information specified in such requests. You are being asked to comply with the law today, and I can imagine you may feel your job as Secretary is on the line. Yesterday, President Trump forcibly ousted Secretary Nielsen, adding to a long list of cabinet level officials that he forced out, including Chief of Staff John Kelly, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, and Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Secretary Mnuchin, will you comply with the law by the deadline tomorrow and furnish the tax returns, even if it means you may be fired by this president for doing so? First of all, thank you very much uh, for that question. I had the opportunity to answer similar questions this morning when uh, I testified earlier today. As I've previously said, uh, I want to acknowledge we have received the request. As I said before, we will follow the law. We are reviewing it with our internal legal uh, department, and uh, I would leave it at that. Thank you, but I guess um what you are basically saying, you follow the law, and you're not afraid that you will be fired if, in fact, you release the returns. Well, I, I, I'm not afraid of being fired at all. Uh, Very good. Uh, having said that, again, yes. I want to be clear. I've said we will follow the law, and okay, we are Okay, and you are clear, and I'm very that. pleased you're not afraid of being fired. Secretary Mnuchin, since President Trump took office, numerous press reports have alleged that Trump associates and campaign officials attempted to negotiate the lifting of U.S. sanctions against Russia. And now I understand that when you lifted sanctions against Rusol, a major aluminum company largely owned by Russian oligarch Oleg Deripaska, you also directly benefited one of your former business associates and close friends, Leonid Blavatovitnik, with whom you owned Rat Pack Dune Entertainment, or RPDE. It also seems that Mr. Uh, Blavatnik was a close relationship with Mr. Deripaska. I have in my possession a series of letters the Treasury exchanged with Congresswoman Jackie Speer that pertain to this issue. Treasury's response to Ms. Speer denies media reports that you sold your ownership 
NRPDE to Mr. Blavatnik, stating that you sold your share to a third party, unconnected to Mr. Blavatnik. However, the letter does not comment, comment on Mr. Blavatnik's company purchasing an interest in a related company, Rat Pack Entertainment, at the exact same time. Who is the third party that you show, sold your shares to? Uh, for, first of all, let me just say, uh, as a relationship with my uh, with Len Blotnick, he's not a close associate of mine. He's someone who I've met. Did uh, you sell to the, him as a third party? No, I did not sell it to him as a third Rat party. Rat Pack directly Entertainment. Or directly. Did Rat Pack Entertainment? I have no connection with Rat Pack Entertainment whatsoever. Nor can I comment on. Nor am I aware of. The specifics of the ownership of Rat Pack Entertainment. It's a completely separate entity. So Rat Pack Doom is, was and is in no way related to Rat Pack Entertainment. Is that correct? Rat Pack Entertainment was a passive investor in Rat Pack Doom. So there is a connection between Rat Pack Doom and Rat Pack Entertainment. Again, Rat Pack, Enter, Rat Pack was an investor in Rat Pack Doom. All right. I was not an investor or associated with Rat Pack. But so when we ask about whether or not the third party uh, was, Rat pa was involved with Rat Pack Entertainment at the same time, one had nothing to do with the other. Is that right? That, that, that is correct. The third party had nothing to do with Rat Pack whatsoever. Well, who is the third party that you sold your shares to? Uh, that, that was a confidential transaction that was sold to a third Was party. it a Russian oligarch? No, I can assure you it was not a, any Russian oligarch or any Russian Why is whatsoever. it you cannot share that information with this committee? I, I don't think it's relevant. I think it's relevant because of your involvement with Russian oligarchs even before you became Treasury Secretary. Uh, uh, and you in the position now where you're dealing with sanctions that were placed on these oligarchs, and it appears that you are delisting or lifting sanctions, and it may be a conflict of interest. Don't you think you need to straighten that out? I don't believe I've ever met a Russian oligarch, nor did I ever do business with a Russian oligarch, and I would just comment that Lotnick, I believe, was from a different country. He wasn't a Russian oligarch. So you never met or talked with or had any conversations with Mr. Deripaska or with um, Mr. Victor Vexelberg or anybody about sanctions. Is that correct? That, that is correct. I've never met either of them. No, no, not met, but had a conversation with I've period. Never, I've never had any conversation with either one of them. And you've never been involved with any oligarchs in terms of the, your previous business, is That's that right? Correct. All right, and so I'm going to have the record record that the third party that you showed your shares to, you refused to reveal to this committee. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, let us continue. The gentleman from North Carolina, ranking member, Mr. McHenry, is recognized for five minutes. Well, Secretary Mnuchin, um, I don't have any questions about your executive producer credentials, um, uh, but uh, I think you did well with uh, American Sniper, Sully, the Lego movie, and uh, most recently, Wonder Woman. Uh, congratulations to you at your uh, box office success. Um, Actually, I thought it was much funnier, but the crowd apparently didn't. Um, so um, thank you for your testimony. Um, as I alluded to in my opening, I wrote you this past January in particular about uh, Brexit. Um, in that letter, I referenced the Financial Stability Oversight um, Board's annual report and a number of outcomes related to Brexit that could uh, trigger distress. Um, so would you describe what... Um, what work you and other regulators have been doing with U.S. financial institutions, um, as well as regulators abroad, to prepare uh, appropriately for um, uh, disorderly Brexit? 
Sure. Well, let me, let me just comment. First of all, I think it's a surprise to many of us that we're sitting here today still waiting to see how this plays out. But uh, over the last year, and specifically over the last two months, I've been working very closely with FSOC and with the, the appropriate regulators to make sure that our financial institutions are prepared for a hard Brexit. Uh, several weeks ago, I was in the UK. I met with uh, both the Prime Minister as well as the, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip Hammond, and discussed it, as well as the uh, head of the Bank of England. So we, we are very carefully monitoring these developments. I think US financial institutions are prepared, but I think there could be some significant disruptions in, in the markets and in, in trade as a result of a hard Brexit. Are our regulators prepared and is our government prepared? Uh, I, I believe we are prepared, although I would just say um, I, I think there will be many aspects of a hard Brexit and uh, we, we, we've encouraged uh, both parties to see if they can have a, a resolution that, that works. How does uh, this week's actions, yesterday and today's actions, um, with the UK government and their conversations with the EU, how does that uh, relate to your, uh, your activities? Have you, have you heightened activities this week as a result? I haven't been privy to the conversations that have been going on uh, yesterday and the day before, but as I said, I've been actively involved with this for the over the last six months, and I think at this point, uh, we need to be prepared for a hard Brexit as a very realistic outcome. Okay. And so, uh, with that mindset, uh, you are prepared on Friday uh, if there is a hard Brexit. Uh, as far as your footprint at Treasury, you've worked to, to see that the, we've done all that we can do in preparation. That, that is correct, and we've coordinated with the Federal Reserve, the OCC, the FDIC, and the other appropriate regulators. So, tomorrow, this committee is holding a hearing with the seven largest financial institutions here in the United States. Um, and from your perspective, um, would you describe, how would you describe the U.S. financial system currently, the current state? I think the U.S. financial system uh, broadly is very well capitalized, has de-risked significantly, uh, and, and is, uh, is in very good shape. So the known knowns are well provided for? They are, but the unknown unknowns are what we always worry about. And that is the nature of financial institutions. That's so correct. some have described the, the banking environment as um, size equals survival. Uh, and as it relates to Dodd-Frank, that has clearly been the case where we have fewer small financial institutions because of the regulatory burden. Uh, can you describe the cost to the system of that regulatory burden? I think it's quite significant, and I, I think you know we worked with this committee and with the Senate last year on reforms to Dodd-Frank to make sure that community banks and regional banks can compete fairly. I think it is important that we have a robust regional bank and community bank system and that we don't end up with uh, just a small number of banks in the country. So greater competition. Absolutely. And less uh, consolidation. As, as basically as a result of regulation. So what role uh, do U.S. financial institutions play in enforcing uh, enforcement of sanctions? Uh, U.S. financial institutions are critical in enforcing our sanctions. So there's enormous benefit to us being the reserve currency and for us having financial institutions to do international trade. Absolutely. The, the U.S. as the reserve currency is, is very, very important. There are many benefits that we have from that, and that's one of the reasons why our sanctions are such powerful national security tools. So if U.S. financial institutions do not play that role in sanctions, how would sanctions enforcement occur? Well, it, it couldn't occur without both U.S. financial institutions and other financial so institutions that are connected to the U.S. system. That is critical. Final question. Uh, you described the embarrassing situation that is the IRS technology footprint. Um, I, we look forward to working with you to ensure that there's proper funding uh, so that the IRS can uh, update its technology footprint. And thank you for making uh, that publicly known. Uh, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Maloney, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Secretary Mnuchin, when you testified to this uh, committee two years ago, I asked about uh, 
beneficial ownership. You said that you look forward to working with us on a solution to this issue. And then when you testified last year, you said, and I quote, we have to figure out beneficial ownership in the next six months. I don't want to be coming back here next year and we don't have this solved. So we need to work with Congress on a bipartisan basis on this, end quote. Well, Mr. Secretary, we have been working on a bipartisan basis on this issue, and I think we're very close to an agreement. Treasury did provide us technical feedback on our bill, and we've incorporated all of your recommendations, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, you've seen the most recent draft of the bill, and I know you're still going through it, but I just want to ask you, do you think that we are headed in the right direction? I, I do believe generally you are headed in the right direction, and I appreciate your work on this. Uh, I hope this is something that on a bipartisan basis we can get accomplished both here and the Senate. Uh, as I've said in the past, uh, there's many things I'm proud of our accomplishments to date. This is not one of them, and I do think we need to solve this, and I hope not to be back uh, again next time without this solved. I, I hope that you're correct. <laughs> Switching topics, you said in testimony this morning that your team had communicated with the White House Counsel's Office about Congress's request for the President's tax returns. But there isn't supposed to be any communication with the White House about this. The process was designed to avoid interference with the White House. Now, I know that you said this morning that you personally weren't involved in those discussions with the White House, but obviously your team told you about those communications. So what did your team tell you about these communications with the White House? Um, well, first of all, let me just say, as I commented on this morning, and I will repeat, I have had no direct conversations with the President or anybody else in the White House about this. <laughs> uh, as I volunteered this morning, I did make clear uh, our legal department has consulted with the White House as, as, as they would and as I believe would, would be normal. That is not taking direction from the White House. I don't view that as interference. Uh, I think, as you know, it was widely publicized that we were going to receive the request and they consulted with them before. It was not specific to the President's, uh, anything related to the President's tax returns other than the expectation of getting this request. Well, did your team ask for the White House's permission to release the President's tax returns? Did the White House ask your team not to release the, the tax returns? Uh, we would not ever ask for the White House's permission on this, nor uh, did they give us the per permission. As I've said, we consulted, which uh, I believe was appropriate of our legal department. Well, I, I think the fact that there was any communication with the White House about this is deeply troubling and certainly violates the spirit of the law, if not the letter of the law. And I think we need to get to the bottom of this, and I yield back. The chair advises members that votes have been called on the floor. The committee will recess for votes and resume immediately following. The committee stands in recess.
The gentleman from Michigan, uh, Mr. Huizing, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I appreciate the chair's recognition and uh, good to see you again, uh, Mr. Secretary. Um, I, I want to touch base uh, real quickly uh, on an international, a couple of international issues, uh, one being uh, Venezuela and the other one uh, I want to touch on Export Import Bank and we'll see if we can get to USMCA as well. Uh, but uh, the United States, as you well know, as well as uh, major European countries have recognized uh, uh, Juan Guaido as the interim president of Venezuela. Um, but the IMF has yet to follow and do the same. And, and I am curious about your thoughts on, on how could Congress uh, support additional resources for the IMF, let alone rescue Venezuela potentially, uh, if the fund disagrees with the latest or the largest shareholders uh, who, on who the legitimate leader of Venezuela currently is? Well, I, I don't think that the IMF necessarily disagrees. As a matter of fact, I was with Christine Lagarde yesterday and we discussed this issue. Um, th there are, the real issue is that we are focused on is what would it take to unlock IMF resources uh, to the interim government? And, th and that's something we are constructively working with the IMF on. And I would say more importantly, um, we're very focused at the appropriate time of, uh, of, of the transition of both using IMF resources and World Bank resources to rebuild the country, that uh, the people of Venezuela are in desperate need of an economic recovery. Uh, and, and, I, and I might add, they, uh, the people of Venezuela deserve better. Uh, they, uh, they deserve better than, uh, than the current regime, and, uh, uh, and I certainly am hoping that uh, uh, Mr. Guaido is, uh, is able to be recognized um, uh, permanently, and uh, but any 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 additional help you can give to uh, to, to make that happen would be deeply appreciated. Um, Export Import Bank, uh, the 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 bank dates back to 1945, and um, the uh, we've had a couple of iterations of uh, reauthorizations, uh, discussions, uh, reforms uh, of uh, of some degree. In fact, in the last uh, the last go around. Um, one of the uh, um, one of the provisions that was put in there was a requirement for the president to pursue negotiations with foreign countries to quote substantially reduce with the possible uh, possible goal of eliminating close quote uh, those countries' export subsidies and I know that was specifically talked about uh, with Airbus and uh, and what could be happening there. And could you please give us an update on Treasury's role in conducting these negotiations and, and what specific progress, uh, if any, are you, uh, are you making in this issue? Yes, thank you. Well, first let me just comment. President Trump is very interested in the Export-Import Bank and making sure that we have a quorum and that it can lend properly. Um, as it relates to export subsidies, that's something the Treasury is very involved in and specifically in uh, the conversations that Ambassador Lighthizer and myself are having with China, that's, uh, that's a topic that's high on the list. Uh, so could you give us a little more specific on the progress on that? So not all of us are big fans of the Export-Import Bank. Uh, when you look at the original intent of it, uh, it, was to, it was to get those smaller industries that were not able to be banked into a foreign transaction to be able to have the resources to be able to do that. Uh, we've seen it go very in some very different directions and, and specifically I'm, I'm looking for what are the, the status of those conversations? The conversations with foreign countries on subsidies or the, or the, the conversations on the use of the Export-Import Bank? Uh, specifically dealing with the foreign, uh, with the foreign companies, uh, sorry, foreign, foreign countries having similar uh, similar uh, structures. The directive was that Treasury negotiate with these countries to try to reduce, if not remove, uh, the need for those. Yeah, so at the G7 and the G20, uh, we've been having very significant conversations. David Malpass, prior to leaving to become head of the World Bank, uh, oversaw those, and, and I think we are, we are making progress also at the OECD. Okay, you had mentioned uh, very quickly in your opening uh, the, about the USMCA uh, coming from Michigan, which uh, uh, some statistics would point to the largest trading partnership being the US and Canada. The sixth largest trading partnership is the state of Michigan and Canada. Uh, give us uh, an update on what's happening there and, uh, and uh, your take on uh, how we are going to be dealing with the USMCA. 
Well, I, I think the trade between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico is very important to our economy. Uh, I think, as I mentioned in the opening statement, that, that uh, this is an agreement that brings forward trade very importantly, and, and, I, and I hope it's, it's brought up within Congress quickly so that it will be passed. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Velasquez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. I was here earlier listening to your exchange with Chairwoman Waters and heard you say that you will comply with the law and furnish President Trump's tax return. Um, but what I did not hear you say to the chairwoman was whether you were going to comply with Chairman Neal's uh, deadline of tomorrow. So my question to you is, yes or no, will you comply with Chair Neal's um, deadline of tomorrow? I want to clarify my previous comments so there's no misunderstanding. I said that I would comply with the law. I and the law say, said, it, and the law, upon re written request from the chairman of the Committee on Ways and Means of the House of Representatives, the chairman of the Committee on Finance of the Senate, or the chairman of the Joint Committee on Taxation, the secretary shall furnish. So that's the law. Again, I just want to be very clear so there's no misunderstanding. I have said that I will comply with the law. I have not made a comment one way or another whether we would supply the tax returns. I want to be very clear on that. We have said we will comply with the law. But what law then are you referring to? That's, this is the law, U.S. Code 56103. So can you tell me what other law talks about that, tax that, returns? That, that is the law. And as I've said, we are consulting with our lawyers. But you say you will comply with the law. With the law. That is correct. Well, well, we'll see about tomorrow. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, in early March, the U.S. officially hit the national debt ceiling, capping the debt at just over $22 trillion. According to the CBO, report produced in February, the Treasury Department will exhaust its use of extraordinary measures sometime in late September or early October. Do you agree with the CBO's projection that the Treasury Department will exhaust its use of extraordinary measures sometime in the fall? I'm not going to give an exact date. Uh, there, there are a lot of assumptions. Um, I think the more important issue is that I have written to Congress, and I would urge Congress on a bipartisan basis to pass the debt ceiling. Um, this is something that's very important to our national debt and our national credit, and I would hope that uh, this is not something okay. that we'd be sitting here in late Thank summer you. still I hear you. Thank you. What will be the consequences both domestically as well as internationally of the U.S. defaulting on even some of its debt? I can't possibly imagine that anybody in Congress would ever want us to default on our debt. It, it would be quite disastrous. So do you think uh, the debt ceiling should be held hostage by any desire President Trump might have to fund his vanity wall? The President has no interest in holding this hostage to any issue. The President has encouraged me, and I've reached out to both the Democrats and the Republicans uh, in, in discussions. The President would like to have this passed as, as soon as we can. Okay. Thank you. Um, in the Treasury Department's budget request for FY 2020, you and President Trump choose to eliminate funding for the CDFI funds discretionary grant and direct loan programs. Can you explain this decision and tell us how you think the communities served by these institutions will be impacted? Thank you. I, I had the opportunity to talk about this issue this morning at the Appropriations Subcommittee, so let me repeat this. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge that I do think uh, this program serves many communities uh, in, a, in a significant way that this was just a difficult decision looking at funding across multiple programs, how we've prioritized it, and if this committee uh, and, and other, if, the, if we have appropriations for that and that's Congress's desire, we shall properly administer the programs as they've been done in you the past. You bet that, it will, that money will be appropriated for the CDFI. 
Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Luke Kumar, is recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome this afternoon, Mr. Chair, uh, Secretary Mnuchin. Um, I know a while ago, uh, Ms. Maloney talked about beneficial ownership, and I just wanted to reiterate, I'm working with her on the bill. Looking forward to uh, working with you to make sure that we get what we need on that. Um, you know, I'm not really happy about codifying a rule. I wish the Treasury would, if we could take our bill and hand it to you and you would make those changes, it would certainly be better than us trying to codify it. But um, to date, we haven't been able to get that done, and so maybe this is the best way to handle it. I don't know. If you've got a comment on it, I'd appreciate a comment. Well, it, it, I, I appreciate the bipartisan uh, views on this, and again, uh, there are specifics we need to work out, and we look forward to sitting down with you and others of the committee to try to get this done soon. I think it's an important. If we could reach a bipartisan agreement, would you be willing to make those changes as a, through the rule process, rather than us have to go legislatively? I think that's something we need to sit down and, and, and discuss with the committee. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> as uh, Secretary of the Treasury, you also serve as Chair of FSOC. FSOC is tasked with identifying risks and responding to emerging threats to financial stability. In the past, FSOC has discussed the issue of CECL and many of the concerns around the standard. Um, in my opinion, uh, CECL affects numerous aspects of the economy and could have drastic pro-cyclical issues like mark-to-market. -market. You know, in my discussions with uh, the FASB, they indicated they did not do any, any prior testing, any, any, any surveying, uh, did not do any uh, studying. And as a result, we're in the same situation with a rule I think could have as dramatic impact as what Mark to Market did whenever they didn't do the due diligence on that one either and had to pull it after the disaster of, of 08. So I'm very concerned about the effect it could have, especially on the GSEs and on, on the credit unions, who if you look at them having to build up reserves, the only way for them to find the income to build up those reserves and, and keep them there is through raising the fees on loans. We had in this committee back in December, the Home Builders Association, which said for every $1,000 increase on a home loan, 100,000 people no longer have access to, to credit or to be able to buy or build a home. That is dramatic. That's gonna have a tremendous effect on the economy if it would have that level of, of cost. They're both doing studies right now to find that out, and we're hopeful that FASB will put a pause on this until we can study this, because they didn't, and they need, we need to have these industry study to make sure we get that done. Would you support something like that? Um, th this is an issue we are, are closely studying. Uh, we look forward to speaking to you and following up on this, and it is something we are discussing very closely at FSOC. And <coughs> since you've mentioned GSEs, uh, I, I do hope that's an area that we can work on on a bipartisan basis for GSC reforms. Well, my concern is that the GSEs are going to have to come up with billions of dollars and to put in their reserves. You know, when you've got a $5 trillion portfolio, just to back the envelope, uh, analysis of a, of a 2 percent reserve, you're at $100 billion, and they're nowhere near that. So I don't know how they're going to raise the money, quite frankly, unless they raise G fees, which that's going to have a dramatic effect on the economy. And it's the same thing with credit unions. So my concern is I hope that, you know, the regulators and a lot of folks who are involved in, 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 in economic policy take into consideration what's going on with Cecil. We'll work to try and find a way to get FASB to pause on this so we can study it to make sure we know what the effects of this are going to be before we implement this rule and don't have the same disastrous results as we did with, um, with uh, Mark to Market. So I appreciate your concern and, and working on that with us. Um, one of the other things I saw about uh, last week or week before last in the Wall Street Journal, there was a, a chart on the front page that talked about the value of European banks versus the value of American banks. And it was kind of interesting because European banks were 70% the, the market value, was 70% of their book value. And American banks were 1.09, or roughly 10%, above book value, which tells me that our banks are in good shape. I think that's, uh, that's great, got a good, strong economy, but it also tells you the European banks are in trouble. Uh, whenever they're valued at 70% or what their book value is, it tells you either the bank's in trouble, the economy in trouble, or both, and that's not good. Um, so I think, you know, um, you mentioned a while ago, and I think uh, the, um, the ranking member talked about Brexit, uh, with that in mind, with, these, with the weakness of the, in my mind, and just splashed on the front page of the journal there, how do you see this playing out? Do you see this as a concern? Do you see this uh, Brexit going to be able to, to work this thing out and the bank's going to recover? Is that rating a, a result of Brexit, or is that just a rating of some other weaknesses in the economy and the banking system? 
Well, as, as you pointed out, there's no question that U.S. banks are much better capitalized than European banks. There's no question that, as you've pointed out, the U.S. economy is much stronger than what's going on in Europe. Um, and as it relates to making predictions on Brexit, uh, that's a complicated thing to predict. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Ch Secretary. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Housing Community Development Insurance, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Uh, I have some concerns about the compliance history of Deutsche Bank and the potential national security and criminal risk posed by its uh, operations in the U.S. Re recently, the New York Department of Financial Services and the U.K. Financial Conduct Authority have brought actions against Deutsche Bank uh, for its role in facilitating suspicious activity in the U.S. Uh, can you comment on any and all enforcement activities involving Deutsche Bank and provide this committee some background for the record? Um, I, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to comment on the regulator's ongoing activity as it relates to Deutsche Bank. Um, the primary responsibility of this is with the, the primary regulators. Obviously, from Treasury standpoint, uh, th that's the OCC and FinCEN. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I can assure you the regulators are very focused on Deutsche Bank as they are on other banks, but I can't comment on ongoing enforcement matters. And does it give you pause or concern about the activities of a, of, of a bank uh, operating uh, in this country uh, with, with some serious questions behind it. Does that give you concern? Um, I want to be careful as secretary what I say, but I have a lot of confidence in our regulators and then being on top of these issues. And I would say as a general matter, not specific to Deutsche Bank, the issues that you talk about we take very seriously and uh, I discuss with the financial regulators regularly. Thank you for that response. When you testified before our committee last July, you stated that at, at this time, the United States finds the IMF's resources are adequate following the 2016 implementation of the 2010 Quota and Governance Reform Package. Most recently in December, um, when Treasury Undersecretary David Malpas um, testified before our committee, he explicitly stated that the administration will not support an IMF quota increase, essentially bringing to a halt a decade of slow progress in um, reforming the fund's governance structure to make it more representative, legitimate, and therefore more effective. Uh, this will seem short-sighted to some as it allows Japan and Europe to maintain its overweight voting power, and of course, none of this will be lost on China or other underrepresented emerging markets. Are you concerned that the administration's rejection of any possible reform of voting shares at the fund could alienate China and other emerging markets? which in turn might cause them to drift away from the multilateral institutions and increasingly towards regionalism. Well, let me just clarify. Um, I am the lead as it relates to the IMF uh, issues. We are actually, I'm looking forward to IMF meetings this week. People are coming in from all over the world. Um, just to clarify what, a few things. We've said, one, we are comfortable with the resources they have today. But I think, as you know, the NAB uh, will roll off. Uh, two, we've said uh, we don't support an increase in quotas, but we are in ongoing discussions with the IMF and the other shareholders about what we do to support the balance sheet. And I think the United States leadership at the IMF as the largest shareholder is very important to us. Well, what about the governance structure? And the governance is also very important, and as part of any ongoing issue, 
governance and reforms are high on the priority list, just as they've been with the World Bank. I see. And um, a couple of years ago, the Chinese UN had joined the U.S. dollar, the euro, the yen, and the British pound in the IMF's special drawing rights uh, basket, which determines currencies that countries can receive as part of IMF fund, uh, loans. Uh, by joining this elite grouping, China certainly doesn't appear to be a developing nation. Uh, if an American from St. Louis wanted to invest in China, could they have full confidence in the Chinese banking system? Uh, the question was, should an American have full confidence in the Chinese banking yes. system? Uh, it's a general comment. I'm sure there are banks there that are well capitalized and banks there that have significant problems. Their, their system is highly leveraged. Thank you. My time is up. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Duffy, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, welcome, Secretary Mnuchin. Uh, I have concerns about the status of the ongoing negotiations at the International Association of Insurance Supervisors. Um, they're developing an international capital standard. I would note that uh, Randy Quarles uh, gave a speech in January and stated that um, the ICS, quote, may not be optimal for the United States insurance markets, uh, obviously expressing some concern about uh, this negotiation. I guess my question to you is, um, looking at uh, this tried and true U.S. system of insurance regulation uh, in your role um, in the FSB, are you going to lean in uh, and protect our system, advocate, fight, negotiate um, for our system and um, our capital standards? Of course. Are you doing that? Yes. Are you respected? I imagine you are. You're pretty well respected. Yes. Yeah. So I manage, if you and, and Mr. Quarles lean into this, we should get a, a better result than what we're hearing from the speech from Mr. Quarles, right? I would hope so. So would I. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's talk Fedwire. Um, obviously, it, it uh, uh, moves over $600 billion a day um, in payments. And last week, Fedwire went down and was completely non-operational for more than three hours. Were you briefed by the Federal Reserve about? I was. And um, can you tell us what happened? I mean, that's a, that three hours concerning. Um, first of all, I would just say I was completely abreast of it real time. Uh, the chair and I were speaking real time on this issue. Uh, we had uh, the Fed had backup plans that I was comfortable with. I think it would be inappropriate in a public forum like this for me to comment on the specifics, but I, I am happy to follow up. Did the backup not work? Here. Excuse me? Did the backup not work because it was down for it, three hours? It, it, again, I, I, I want to be careful. I'm more than happy to come and talk to okay. you in a different setting. I will say I have complete confidence in the Fedwire system. I was fully aware of the specifics of what were going on. Um, it, it, we were completely on top of it. Okay, I'd, I'd appreciate it for the conversation in a different setting. Um, are you a lawyer? I am not, but I deal with a lot of lawyers. I'm sorry about that. Um, so I, I don't know if you have an opinion as to, do, do, maybe you know this, do, do, is, is a presidential candidate or a president required to release their tax returns? I do not believe they are. And it's been common practice oftentimes that they will release their tax returns, but they're not required. Is that your understanding? I believe that's the case. And I actually agree with that practice. I, I have said publicly, I think that President Trump should release his tax returns. That'd be a good thing. Um, but the president's chosen not to release his tax returns. Uh, I think you can get a lot more questions today about taxes. Um, and I would just note that um, to walk down a political road where we're going to uh, use the chairman of Ways and Means and the power given to the chair for political purposes to gain the tax returns of our political opponents. Um, we know that when one action is taken, it oftentimes doesn't stop. I don't know if anyone in this room wants to have their taxes released. I don't know um, if Hillary and Bill want theirs released and Obama want his. We, we could play this game out. Um, and I guess this is for no investigative purpose. We heard for um, two years that Bob Mueller has to be protected. Bob Mueller is the gold standard. Don't cut his money, 
you make sure that you protect him and let him do his work. And he did his work. We got a synopsis, and it's not over. We continue to have debate about, well, there might be something in the report. Maybe we have to get the re actual report out regardless of what is um, uh, confidential, what's from investigations. Um, and now we've gone to tax returns, and I guess I want you to follow the law. Uh, that's important. Um, but I would just note that in this room, we should be awfully concerned about what's good for the goose is good for the gander. What uh, happens here will probably come around uh, and bite you as well. And so um, the president's not required to release the taxes. He hasn't released them. I think he should. He hasn't. Uh, and I think we should let it go at that. Uh, well, as I, I've said, we do intend to, to follow the law. I would just say uh, I think that if Kevin Brady, when he had been chair of the committee, had requested high-profile Democrat tax returns, there would have been significant concerns. There but would have been concern. I'm, sh I'm shocked to hear that, Mr. Secretary. Of course there would have been concern. I agree with you. Mr. Duffy, your time is over. Um, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Duffy, you went there. Barack Obama did return his, did disclose his tax returns. In fact, every president of the United States since Nixon reported that we uh, opened their tax return. And in fact, isn't what someone says when they give their word, shouldn't one be their word is their bond and they should live by what their word is? Is that not correct, Mr. Secretary? If you say something, to the American people, you should tell them the truth. Is that not correct? I, I, I do tell the truth. OK. But since Mr. Duffy brought it up, the President of the United States told the American people that he would release his tax returns. And he's done it at least 16 times, that he would release his tax returns. He made a promise to the American people. Now, shouldn't the President of the United States be a man or a woman of their word? Well, let me just comment that... Yes I, or no, Mr. Mucha? I, I'd like to answer the question. Just answer yes or no. Should not. It's a yes or no, it's a yes or no question. I, again, what I've read in the press, he said he'd Should. release his returns when he wasn't under audit, but I'm not privy to the specifics of that. He has said several times, he said before he was elected President and after he was elected President, that he would release his tax returns, and then we hear from his chief of staff that he's never, under any circumstances. So that means that he has lied to the American people. I hope, Mr. Secretary, you're not a liar, and other individuals in the administration is not a liar, and that when you testify, you're testifying to the truth and not deceiving individuals. I hope. Madam as Chair, this I'm president, raise as this point of order, as this president, you open the door, sir. If the gentleman is calling you the president the a liar, yes, point of order. I didn't call anybody. I'm, I'm saying that you can go to the videotape and see what the president said and what he and what he hasn't done. And so, yes, if that is that I am the calling the president, the president of the United States a liar. I have, yes. I have a point of order, though. If just trying there to is no point of order. What is your point of order? It's my point of order. So. Is, is the president a covered are personality? to avoid personality in their remarks. What is your point of order? That uh, he's, the, the president is a covered personality, and I believe the gentleman was uh, calling the president a liar. The chair does not recognize that as a point of order. Will the gentleman proceed with Yes, you? I just want a few more times at the point, point of order. I need a few I would, more I would move to take the gentleman's back. words down. So, what I am saying, Mr. Secretary, is that the American people listens to what someone, when they make a statement and make a commitment to the American people of whether or not they live up to it or not. And I am also stating that I'm hoping that individuals of the administration do the same, because there have been reports already that the president yesterday were telling individuals to disobey the law in regards to the security, the, the border, line and telling officers don't listen to the judges. Now I came here with a whole other series of questions that I wanted to ask, but Mr. Duffy went there because I wanted to know some other things that are important to the American people. And now I'm, he's raised my concerns because you know, generally what happens at the top goes all the way down 
and with all of the individuals that were fired yesterday, uh, some because they're trying to tell the president to follow the law, and then the president would not follow the law, then it gives me concern, and I think that's why the chairwoman asked you, are you concerned about your job? Because it seems that those individuals within the administration who follows the law and may tell the truth and not try to deceive individuals, you know, some kind of way, the administration of the president seems to want to fire them. And that was the, the, the nature of her initial questions uh, that she had with you. And I've almost lost all of my time, so I'll just ask one question. I wanted to ask about, uh, uh, talk about leverage lending and things of that nature, which is important, but I don't have that kind of time. So let me ask you this. Slapping tariffs on our allies have made for tough negotiations. Do you believe those tariffs have been overly disruptive? And how do they serve our purpose when it comes to negotiating with Mexico and Canada? Because it seems to me that they don't. Well, I'm, I'm very pleased with the agreement we have with Mexico and Canada. And I will tell you, as it relates to China, the tariffs have been effective in getting China to the negotiating table. And I know you ran out of time, but let me just comment on leverage lending since you brought that up. Uh, Chair, would, would you like me to comment on? I, I won't. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Stivers, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm over here, Mr. Secretary. Thanks for being here today. Um, so, um, uh, Ambassador Lighthizer uh, testified in front of the Ways and Means Committee recently and said that it's really important to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank because it supports American jobs and American exports. Do you agree with Ambassador Lighthizer's assessment? I do. Great. Uh, and we look forward to working with you on a bipartisan basis to uh, reauthorize the Export-Import Bank and make important reforms to make sure that it has um, all the, um, um, you know, uh, safeguards that need to be in place for the taxpayers and, and to make sure that it is running effectively. But uh, I really appreciate uh, your thoughts and opinions on that. Um, I said I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, suspicious activity reports. And you, you're in charge of the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, that collects suspicious activity reports, SARS. Um, and almost a million of those were filed last year by financial institutions. Many times that happens without a feedback loop to the financial institutions to help them be better at preparing and knowing what was good information, what was bad information. Um, and it seems to me that my, there might be a better way to conduct SARS, even if we don't change the reporting threshold, just getting the information and making it more useful in a central database or, or some type of way where it's queryable by the folks that need it. Uh, are you working on anything to make those more effective? Yes, we are. First, let me just comment. Uh, the SARS are very important for all of our law enforcement and uh, our activities around sanctions. So when I was a banker, I was concerned these things just went into a black hole. We do use them. But we are actively looking at the policy around SARS, and uh, we're working with FinCEN and TFI on looking at whether we should make certain changes. So thank you for bringing that up. And if you could, uh, and I, I understand that you can't report back on everything, but there may be a way to create a feedback loop to make uh, the production more effective. Some of these folks are again and again doing the same thing and maybe making the same, same mistakes on these suspicious activity reports or making them less effective for foreign law enforcement than they could or should be. So some type of feedback uh, would be very helpful for a lot of folks that want to help as you're trying to help catch the bad guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, I wanted to uh, touch something that I know some other people have talked about. Uh, tomorrow there's going to be a hearing with seven of the large uh, financial uh, banks in America. And, um, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about um, what would happen with sanctions if, if we didn't have large American banks. If the U.S. didn't have global banking institutions and instead we had to rely on European entities, Chinese entities, and other foreign entities to help um, try to make our sanctions effective, um, would they be able to be implemented? And would they be as effective on shutting down rogue regimes? 
No, no, they wouldn't. The, the U.S. financial system and the strength of it and the importance of the dollar and the large financial institutions are all critical to our sanctions enforcement. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Lady. Um, Treasury Secretary Murchin, are you under oath to tell us the truth today? Uh, I don't know technically if I'm under oath or not, but I'm here to tell you the truth, yes. You're here to tell us the truth. Have you any, or have you ever had any business dealings with Russians? Um, have I had any business dealings with Russians? Yes, um, sir. Not that I'm aware of, but I just want to be clear. My great-grandparents emigrated here from Russia, so I, I, I may be a, a minuscule part Russian myself. This. Have you ever had any business dealings with Russian oligarchs? No. As I commented earlier, I, I don't even believe I have know any Russian oligarchs. Do you have any knowledge of anyone in the Trump administration that has done business with Russians? The, the Trump administration is very large. I cannot comment on the entire Trump administration. Do you know, if we get specific then, of any business dealings that President Donald Trump has had with Russians as a businessman? I have no access to the president's finances, no, I don't, other I'm than not what asking, I read in, in the press. I'm not asking access. You see, Mr. Mnuchin, you are the Treasury Secretary. You are our chief steward of all economic matters as far as we are concerned in the world, trade matters, financial matters. It is within your purview and covers the waterfront, just as our very first Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton, did. Treaties, you name it. My whole point is this. Now, the reason these questions are coming up to you is there's such a great hunger among the American people to try to find out what is it about Russia and the relationship with this administration that causes this unease. Nowhere was that more paramount than in sitting on the world stage. President Trump took the word the advice of Putin over his own Treasury Secretary, his own intelligence. So it sets many in the American, I would say the large majority. And that's why we're trying to get to these questions. But before I go, um, I want to get back to the trade issue, something that you are dealing with. Uh, I represent the great state of Georgia, and we are number one in peanuts, pecans, poultry, and number two in cotton. And right now, all of these indices are suffering. And I want to just get your opinion here. The latest data says that nearly 100% of cotton produced in the United States is, is exported. U.S. cotton and cotton yarns are subject to an additional 25% tariff in China due to the trade dispute. Georgia makes one-third of all the pecans producers in the nation. Half of those go to China, 25%. Where, where is this coming to? And you just made a statement that China's resolved. How so? 
when my people in Georgia, my farmers and producers, are just hanging on by their fingernails because of this trade situation. What can you tell me to tell my farmers in Georgia? I want, and I want to just make two quick statements. First of all, I don't believe that the president listened to Putin over me, okay, or am I aware his intelligence. On the farmers, I can assure you I am working very hard on the China deal, and agriculture is a very important part of that. So I appreciate that. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is thank, recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today. Uh, there's currently a debate going on in our country about the economic existence of capitalism versus socialism. As you know, I'm a small business owner. I'm a car dealer who is a strong believer in markets, the concept of risk and reward, and individual freedom. The U.S. economy is growing at the fastest pace in over a decade, while most of the developed world is experiencing an economic slowdown. And yet some people, uh, some on the other side of the aisle, are unwilling to accept the reality that our success for the past two years is a result of reducing the government's footprint in the free market. So, Mr. Secretary, are you a capitalist or a socialist? I am a capitalist. That's great. And what effect would it have on GDP and the U.S. economy if we began to turn away from free market principles and take a more socialist approach? I, I think it would be disastrous for the economy, and every single country that's pursued those economic goals uh, has deteriorated significantly. Uh, Venezuela, Cuba, just to name a few. And many more. Yep. Uh, the economy is booming because the tax cuts that were enacted last year are simply working. Unleashing the power of the private sector has led to an increased capital investments, <laughs> more job opportunities, and higher wages for workers. These are all very positive outcomes in the short term, and these uh, capital investments will continue to pay dividends into the future. With that being said, we should not get complacent. What do you see as the biggest obstacle holding back the economy from even higher growth? I, I think the good news is the, the economy is in very good shape. I think that uh, clearly the, the world economy has slowed down. That's having some impact. I think getting our trade agreements renegotiated is probably the single most important issue for the economy, and that's why it's such a big priority of this administration at the moment. Last week, the Texas bankers visited my office and talked about the Bank Secrecy Act. Uh, we discussed the current thresholds for currency transactions, suspicious activity reports being so low that it creates a heavy compliance burden for small banks. When the CTR threshold of $10,000 was initially implemented in 1970, uh, that was enough to buy two brand new automobiles. This is no longer the case because of inflation. So how would you recommend adjusting the current CTR and SAR regi uh, regime to make compliance easier for smaller institutions? Well, we're, we're looking at this carefully, and I, I am sympathetic to the issue for community banks and small regional banks. Having said that, with the advance of technology, and people can break transactions up into many, many, many smaller transactions, uh, we're not yet convinced that raising the limit is the appropriate issue, but we're continue to study it. Uh, well, our country is moving in the right direction economically. I and a lot of people, and I'm sure included yourself, are worried that we are not paying enough attention to the national debt, uh, which recently surpassed $22 trillion, as we know. So as I said, I'm concerned that our national debt will ultimately hinder economic growth in the country. Uh, the net interest payment on the debt in 2018 was $371 billion. That affects a lot of things, and Fort Hood is in my district, and it affects the military. They're concerned about it. So that's a huge number. So how concerned should we be about our soaring national debt? I'm glad you brought it up. I think the debt is something that has doubled uh, in, in the previous administration. I think it's something that we have to be careful and watch government spending. That's why the, the president is trying to look at decrease in government spending. The most important issue is growth. I'm comfortable that we can support the national debt as a percentage of GDP as it is now, but we need to be on a pathway to, to make sure that uh, the deficits don't continue to balloon and that government spending is not out of control. We, we're of the age we remember 20% interest in our lifetime, and six or seven was a good rate, but uh, right now with the debt, six or seven could be, uh, could be harmful. So. I think that uh, we're, all, we're, we're doing the right thing and worried, being worried about it. And then on a side note, I'd like to, you and I have had conversations in the past on interest rates, 
and uh, uh, we've agreed on a lot of where the interest rates ought to go, and Chairman Powell was here the other day and said that interest rates would remain flat, so I want to thank him for that, and thank you for hearing me out when I talk about it. I yield my time back, Ms. Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy, is, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the President, um, I believe, has, has expressed publicly his support for the reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank. And uh, I'm, because he, he has, um, and, and, and there are people on both sides of the aisle who are also interested, uh, has Treasury re, uh, has submitted the reauthorization request? I, I'm glad to hear that there is uh, bipartisan support because this is important to the President. And uh, my understanding is th that we are working on that. We would like to see this. Well, don't you, uh, yes sir. Uh, we, we have a, only until September. And so it would be good if we had a reauthorization request submitted now. Um, and I mean, that's one step before uh, we're going to be able to get something done that can be done re relatively easily. So uh, my understanding is this is going through the interagency process at the moment. We're not the lead, but we are actively supporting this. And, and I appreciate your, your focus on this. Let me be clear. We want to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank. So we can, it will be done shortly? I, as I, I am going to go back and find out the exact status from the people who are working on it. Yes. Madam Chair, is it appropriate shortly. for me to ask if, if, if I could receive or, or if the committee could receive? The, the, we'll we'll Spiders, follow up with your staff. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, let me go back and visit some places where you've been uh, uh, earlier. Um, uh, my first concern, you know, is, is the American public, as, as it is, I'm, I'm sure, yours. Uh, but the American public is losing uh, on uh, the tariffs. And uh, it's, it's not just coming from me or Democrat. It's, it's coming from all over the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has already said that we're going to lose $1.6 billion uh, in uh, export trade or uh, that, that's threatened. And in my district, we're being decimated. I, I can understand why Senator Grassley uh, came out and said we need to focus on creating opportunities instead of erecting barriers. I'd like to see a resolution with Canada, Mexico, and steel, aluminum, uh, uh, et cetera. It's killing, that's my next door neighbor, Nebraska. My farmers are being bl bludgeoned uh, I drove by some uh, soybean fields two weeks ago to look at flood damage, and people are leaving the soybeans in the field from $10 uh, uh, down to $8, $8 now and dropping. Uh, I mean, people are, are hurting. Uh, if, if you had a chance to look at the state of Missouri, uh, $432 million we export to Canada, $72 million to, ex to, to uh, Mexico, $80 million to China, 239 million to Europe. Uh, you know, I, I spoke to a, a farmer on Friday, and he said, our patience is running out. I mean, can you, when I go back home on Friday, and I'm going out into to, to, to the rural parts of my district, which is significant, I mean, what do I, what do I say? I mean, uh, you know, they, they, they voted for the, for the president, uh, you know, is it too much for them to expect not to continue to be hurt? No, they, they will be hurt. And I, I've been accused that all I want to do is sell soybeans, but I, I can tell you I want structural reforms. But uh, the Vice Premier, when he was here last time, committed a very big order of soybeans, and I can assure you that agriculture is very important to the President, and that's on the top of the list of issues to be resolved. I, I understand your concerns. Uh, yes. It's, um, my farmers don't, don't know anything about that. I, uh, uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about U.S. Tariffs, tariffs costing American consumers about $6.9 billion. Again, this year did last year, so and it may go up this year. And, and so I, I appreciate your concern uh, for my appreciation, for, uh, but I, you know, I gotta go home uh, Friday. 
I got to talk to folks, and I, I, I'd like to say, uh, I spoke to the Secretary of Treasury, and he said next Thursday at 3 o'clock, uh, the pain will begin to uh, be diminished. Can I, or should I say Friday? What, what day? Well, I, I can tell you, the Chinese have committed a very, very large order while we are negotiating. They've committed significant orders in the soybean Already? market. Yes, already. And, and they, are, they are in the markets uh, executing those orders. Thank you, Madam Chair. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, thank you so much for your testimony and really the great work you and your department are doing on behalf of the American people. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think you would agree that America is broadly seen as the world's land of opportunity. People from all over the world, capital from all over the world, uh, comes here. And, and it's still attracted to the United States of America. In fact, our GDP growth, our wage growth, uh, favorable markets are the envy of the world. Um, we are an outlier in many respects to the rate of performance over the past two years. And one of the areas that I get concerned at is, is in the midst of all that, why are some things not quite working? America is still the most innovative country in the world. But when I see American innovators taking their innovation and raising the capital for that innovation outside the United States, something seems to be broken. What's wrong with our markets that this would happen? And so as I look at blockchain right now, for example, I see this reality where the innovation is happening in the United States and elsewhere, but it's rapidly happening elsewhere because even American companies are raising the capital outside the United States because they don't have the regulatory certainty they need uh, for capital formation. And without the capital formation, you know, we see so often uh, that the development just doesn't take place. So that's why today a bipartisan uh, group from this committee and outside the committee introduced the Token Taxonomy Act that would provide regulatory uh, certainty for the crypto market to define what is a security and what is not a security. But are you following the developments in blockchain and the, um, you know, just the dynamic impact that could have, uh, not just for capital formation, but for security, for the frameworks that we have uh, for data security. Uh, uh, Premier Xi Jinping, uh, maybe with hyperbole, said that he believes that the blockchain will be 10 times more significant than the internet. So are you tracking uh, blockchain significantly in the Department of Treasury? Um, I am. There's not many things I would say I'd take the other side of that, but I don't think blockchain will be 10 times more significant than the internet. We are working uh, with all the regulators on blockchain, more importantly, on crypto assets. We want to make sure that these can't be used for illicit purposes. Uh, and I'm not familiar with your bill, but I'm happy to follow up with your staff and, and understand your ideas. Uh, thank you, Secretary. And uh, your staff has been very helpful, uh, as have uh, people across industry, people in the SEC. Uh, and there's a good nonpartisan issue, uh, support for a nonpartisan uh, topic as to where should this be regulated. But more broadly, when we look at this gap, you see uh, when there's a gap between our regulatory frameworks and the demand, supply and demand get an imbalance, there's a black market. Uh, the United States uh, or, or the market simply moves. There's no black market. And if you look in the past 12 months, Binance moved to 50% uh, market share for crypto, crypto assets. A uh, part of the regulatory framework, as you highlighted earlier, that our banks have uh, is because so much moves through the US financial system. So much moves through the protocols that the United States has helped establish, and that it would include trade and including financial trade. So I, I really think it would be advantageous for the United States to stay at the forefront of this. We are rapidly losing ground. We need to quit studying the issue and get regulatory certainty for our market uh, in this space. Um, I would say that uh, at, towards that end, one of the encouraging things to me, as you highlighted in the USMCA, is trade. And in particular, I wonder if you could highlight some of the um, financial services wins, because we hear so much more about manufacturing or agriculture. Uh, we see the expansion of financial services uh, coverage in USMCA and including the framework that we're working on with China. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. We think the financial services improvements in USMCA are quite significant and, and quite frankly, are a model to use in other trade agreements. And 
financial services in our discussions with China are very high on the list, and we've made a lot of progress. Um, thank you for that. And when you look at the framework and the protocols, FinCEN, whether you're talking, you know, OFAC with our sanctions, um, one of the underpinnings of that is the Bank Secrecy Act. My colleague, uh, Ms. Maloney, highlighted the work that she's done on beneficial ownership. I would just caution that as we look at this uh, framework, um, you mentioned earlier that you conducted a private transaction that you'd like to remain private. There are legitimate business purposes why that should still be the case and should be subject only to discovery, not total uh, uh, pe criminal penalties for people that don't file forms that they don't even know exist. Uh, and I yield. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Sherman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. I'm actually going to agree with you on a couple of uh, things. That's uh, a welcome. We should reauthorize the Exim Bank, as the gentleman from Ohio pointed out, but it's meaningless unless you fill the seats on the board. Can you tell us now that the president will fill the seats on the Exim board and push Senate to uh, confirm so that uh, uh, we uh, uh, can get a functioning Exim Bank? Well, I mean, uh, by way of background, even uh, if you authorize it, no, I, I if know. you don't put board members on it, they can't do anything. I, I'm going to agree with you as well that not only do we have to reauthorize it, but we need the board quorum. Um, and I can assure you the president is very interested in having the board filled. So. Uh, but has not appointed. Uh, I, I hope that you'll get him uh, more interested in actually appointing rather than thinking about appointing. Second, as to tariffs, uh, nobody, no economist wants tariffs. But tariffs are often the only way to push other countries to drop their tariffs and other barriers to entry. The Chinese have, calcula uh, have calculated uh, that we are in a stronger position to impose pain on them in order to get them to change, but that their political system is better able than ours to endure pain, and therefore they will beat us in these negotiations, uh, make only token changes, and that we will continue to have the largest trade deficit in the history of bilateral trade in the history of the world. My hope is, and, and I know the, that tariffs can be painful on both sides, uh, that you will do what's necessary to get us a trade relationship with China that is not the most pernicious, cancerous, uh, a malignant, and lopsided uh, trade relationship uh, in history. Uh, as to uh, marijuana, I don't know if uh, Ed Perlmutter has spoken yet or not. Uh, I know they've got to have some pride in the fact that those $100 bills bear your signature. But carrying around big sacks of $100 bills through our neighborhoods in California um, is not good public safety. Uh, will the administration be, uh, uh, come out in favor of allowing those marijuana institutions that are legal under state law to be able to have access to the banking system? Well, let me comment on it. Uh, I think this is a significant issue particularly in, in my many roles, including the IRS, where we've had to build cash rooms to, to take in the cash. I'm not going to make a comment on what the policy should be. There is a problem that there is a conflict between the federal law and state law. And until that is resolved, we, we cannot deal with without legislation or some other Will you way. endorse, uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, within the jurisdiction of the committee, uh, and uh, uh, relevant to your functions, will you endorse uh, Mr. Perlmutter's legislation, which we passed by, on a bipartisan basis through this committee uh, recently? I, I need to review it. I'm not familiar with Can you get with back it, to I'd us be, within I, two I'd, weeks I'd, on I'd, this? I'd, I'd be happy to review it, and my staff will and I hope follow we, up. And then uh, uh, on the Exim Bank, the pressure has got to be not so much to appoint, but to get McConnell to confirm. Um, I believe you finally sent up uh, uh, enough people to make a quorum. Um, Korea, throughout the, uh, uh, on an uninterrupted basis for many years, they've continued to create more fissile material. If you want a better deal, you're going to have to have stronger sanctions. Uh, I chair and uh, Mr. Yoho is uh, the ranking member. We had reversed roles in prior years. We've sent you two letters 
urging you to sanction those major Chinese banks uh, that uh, have violated uh, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, sanctions. So far, we've only uh, uh, sanctioned minor uh, Chinese companies. But in particular, on May 21st, uh, there was the announcement uh, by your department of uh, sanctioning two relatively small shipping firms from China. Uh, then uh, the president tweeted the next day that he's withdrawing. Then it was announced that he wasn't withdrawing what you had done, but was stopping you from doing something else. Um, is there something more important than what you did on May 21 that you're considering and that the president has told you not to do? Uh, let me, first of all, I'd say the, the, the sanctions are very important on North Korea. It's the only reason why they are negotiating. Well, I know pretending to negotiate is what they do when we have inadequate sanctions. I, Making real concessions is what they do when we have good sanctions. I, Go ahead. I don't think we have inadequate sanctions. I think we have the strongest sanctions that ever existed. I know there was some confusion uh, about the tweets. As I've clarified, the president never told me to take off those sanctions, and we didn't. I can't comment on future sanctions, what we'll do one way or another, but sanctions... Are you looking at major Chinese banks, without naming names? Mr. Chair um, Mr. Chairman, your time has expired. Again, I, th I think it would be inappropriate for me to make any specific comment on people who we're going to sanction in the future, whether it's there or anywhere else. But the gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Budd. Uh, thank the chair for yielding. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, also thank you for, uh, for being here. I want to follow up on uh, my colleague from uh, Wisconsin, Mr. Duffy, uh, what he mentioned on the topic of international insurance regulations. So if the IAIS, or the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, refuses to do what my colleague from Wisconsin asked and provided the U.S. system formal recognition of this upcoming Abu Dhabi meeting, Will you be willing, you, Mr. Secretary, would you be willing to force the IAIS to delay the adoption of the international capital standards to a later date where they will recognize the U.S. system and our aggregated capital approaches being developed by both the state insurance commissioners, all 50 states, and the Federal Reserve? And, and here's why I'm asking this question, background. It's, so it's critical that the U.S. insurance companies are provided the same or some regulatory certainty and that they don't have to spend the next five years, which, by the way, is the time of the ICS monitoring and testing period, they don't have to spend the next five years wanting to know if the U.S. regulatory system will be sufficient for the IAIS. So will you agree to either make the IAS uh, publicly and formally recognize the U.S. system at that Abu Dhabi meeting um, or delay the adoption uh, to a later date? I, I want to be careful making a public commitment on this, but I'm happy to speak to your office and we'll follow up. I can assure you that we are focused on and in favor of the U.S. system, which is critical to our insurance companies. That's, that's very helpful. It sounded like you were willing to, and I, I don't want to put you in a corner on this. I understand the, the sensitivity here, but it sounded when you were talking with my colleague that you would like to make that sort of commitment. And uh, how certain are you that we can give some certainty to our state-based uh, insurance companies, uh, how, how certain are you that you can give them some future certainty? We, we always want to have regulatory certainty. That, that's critical, and this is an issue we're focused on. So I look forward to following up with your office on this as we make progress quickly. Thank you for that. So another concern I have with these international negotiations involves FIO or the Federal Insurance Office. So under the Trump administration, we've seen the office stay really within its bounds and has not acted like an insurance regulator, which is good. But I've got serious concerns about the office being involved in overseas negotiations and even more concern about what the office could look like under a future administration. Uh, for example, under the previous administration, the office went down the road of performing activities like involving or, or issuing arbitrary and inaccurate reports, commenting negatively on the domestic insurance industry, initiating duplicative and unnecessary data calls, and acting like a quasi-regulator via the use of its uh, very powerful subpoena authority. So, Mr. Secretary, how does the current administration view the role for the office? And would you agree with me that it's important to put regulatory bounds on the FIO going forward to prevent what happened during the previous administration, or even worse? 
Well, I can, I can comment on what we're doing. I'm not an expert on what's done in the previous administration. That's fair. Go ahead. I, I look forward to getting updated on that. It, it is not a regulator. It's not meant to be a regulator, and we would never support it being the primary regulator. And in, your, in the administration that you work in, can you put some constraints on it that would protect against abuses in future administrations? We, we, we will take suggestions from you on this in your office and work with you on it. Look forward to the, uh, the dialogue there. So in the time I have left, I want to switch over and I want to uh, discuss Hezbollah, who has a, a very sophisticated network of criminal activities to fund its terror, oper terror operations in Lebanon and throughout the world, and they pretty much use a lot of funding from Iran. The U.S. Treasury Department plays a vital role in helping to identify and stop the flow of illicit funds uh, to the terror group. So Mr. Secretary, what steps is the Treasury currently taking to stop the flow of resources to Hezbollah? And in particular, what are we doing to stop Iranian resources from going to Hezbollah? Well, I think you know we have the, the toughest sanctions on Iran, and we are very focused on, as you said, Hezbollah. We're also focused with working with people in the region. One of the reasons why I need to to leave this evening is because I have a bilat that's an important bilat that's focused on combating terrorist financing. This is one of both my most important priorities and the department's most important priorities. So last year, um, Congress passed the Hezbollah International Financing Prevention Amendments Act of 2018 uh, to increase our ability to target Hezbollah's goal or global financing and reach. What steps um, has the Treasury taken to implement specifically this new legislation? Well, first of all, we very much appreciate the additional funding we've had for TFI to build up these resources. And uh, again, since we're running out of time, we'll follow up with you on the specific steps. I look forward to that. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you recently had an encounter with ethics, and this had to do with an entity that you sold to your then fiance, now wife, and by the way, this is in no way intended to demean her in any way, nor is it intended to demean you, but uh, you sold Storm Chaser Productions, and you sold it to her, and uh, Ethics, after having reviewed it, concluded that given that you uh, gave an indication, let's call it a promise, to recuse yourself if there are any future dealings with the government and Storm Chaser, there would be no penalties imposed. Is this true? Well, I appreciate you raising this because I want to Excuse be Excuse me, I, I need to know if this is true because I, I really don't want to dwell on it. I'm going to something else. Is this true? That, I, that I've, I've committed to recuse? Yes, sir. It? If yes, I've, I've signed a new ethics agreement that has clarified, but just to be clear, had there been conflicts before then, I would have recused myself. So I've been in touch with ethics officials for the last two years, okay. Treasury ethics officials. Thank you. Uh, as I said, I, I don't intend to dwell on that issue, but I do plan to go to another issue now that inv involves an entity known as Rat Pack Dune. Are you familiar with Rat Pack Dune? I, I am very familiar with it. And is it true that um, you have sold your interest in Rat Pack Dune? Yes, I sold it a long time ago. And is it true that um, you have uh, indicated that you need not expose the third party that you sold it to? I'm sorry, could you repeat Is it true that you've indicated that you need not and will not expose the third party that you sold it to. It was a confidential transaction. A confidential transaction, uh, which means that we have no idea, we meaning the oversight committee, will have no idea as to what the terms of the con conditions were. Not that I'm overly interested in your personal business, but we don't know what the provisions are and we don't know who, what the entity is that purchased. Is that a fair statement? Uh, the transaction was fully approved by the ethics people at Treasury, uh, so I, I don't anticipate but, there are any issues. But uh, it's true that we are charged with the responsibility of oversight, correct? Uh, you agree. Sure you do. Yeah, we are. I'm, I'm not an expert on your oversight well, responsibilities, so Let, let I'll, me just I'll assure you that we correct. are. We're charged with oversight. So the question becomes, how do we perform oversight of that which we cannot see. Uh, it is uh, very difficult at best, probably impossible to accomplish. 
I mention it to you because we live in a world, Mr. Secretary, where it's not enough for things to be right. They must also look right. This may look right to some, but the truth be told, the American public is concerned. In the case that you had with your wife, you signed an agreement to recuse, and if there is a conflict, we will be aware of the conflict and understand that you must recuse. With Rat Pack, we will not have the ability to monitor the relationship because we have no idea as to what it is. Therefore, we cannot ascertain, based on empirical evidence, whether you should recuse. My point is this. It would seem to me that in the interest of the public uh, having a belief that our system functions fairly and properly uh, with transparency, that you would reveal to whom you sold the interest. You don't have to tell us how much. There are numbers floating around, 25 million, but uh, it would seem that you would reveal this. You've said you won't, so I won't ask you to do it. But it just seems to me that that would be an appropriate thing for a person who has the lofty position of being the treasurer of the United States of America. Seems that that would be appropriate. I won't ask you to respond. Well, I, I do want to have the opportunity to respond. I just want to make one thing and clarify, and this is all in the public domain. Uh, the entity of Rat Pack Dune had a transaction with Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers bought it out, and that entity is fully liquidated. So not only do I not have any interest in that entity at this point, but nobody has any interest in that. That entity has been fully, so there couldn't possibly be any ongoing conflict uh, whatsoever. And I will take your word for it. Thank you. Unfortunately, I have to. I yield back my time. and. I Recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Secretary, for being here. Um, so I think there's a lot of reasons for us to be very excited about the state of the United States economy, certainly when you compare it to, to what's going on in Europe uh, and through really the entire world. Uh, we can look at GDP, unemployment, wage growth, uh, tons of reasons to be excited. And I agree. I think a lot of it has to do, primarily has to do with the deregulation and the tax cuts. I think it's fairly obvious. Um, when I think about the next stage of growth and how we can keep this moving, uh, I go directly to trade, uh, specifically U.S.-China. And uh, I want to thank you and the administration for finally stepping up and pushing back against China. I think now kind of the curtain's been pulled back and, and I think the entire country has a, a good sense of just how disruptive they've been. Um, but I want to ask sort of a tactical question to push back a bit. Um, my only real concern is we've, we've been going it alone in that one. Um, we're pursuing at the moment what seems like primarily a bilateral agreement. And I guess I would like to hear your perspective on why we've chosen bilateral versus partnering with some of our other allies um, and if there is a plan to, to do that. Because it strikes me that that would be a more forceful and pot potentially durable uh, front. Well, we do talk about these issues of China trade at the G7. It's something important. Having said that, uh, you know, we've been unsuccessful for a long time doing this on a multilateral basis. Um, I think we are making a lot of progress. Uh, Ambassador Lighthizer is doing a terrific job with everybody at USTR. I have a call with him tonight with the Vice Premier. And as we've said, we're making progress. If we are able to conclude this, these will be the most significant structural changes that have ever occurred. If we're able to conclude this, there will be an enforcement that's very important to this. There'll be an enforcement department built under the vice premier. Uh, so we still have significant issues, but this, this will be one of the biggest accomplishments for U.S. trade, U.S. companies, U.S. workers, if we're able to open up their markets on a fair and level playing field and get structural changes. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And like I said, I, I applaud the effort. Uh, hopefully, don't, don't mistake my comments for suggesting otherwise. Um, you touched on uh, the enforcement piece. Uh, and 
again, I saw last week China decided or said that they would shut down their fentanyl factories. Obviously, I'm, so I'm from Northeast Ohio. Fentanyl opiates been a huge challenge for our community. Um, that's an in incredible promise. Uh, the next question is on the enforcement. So specific to that on the fentanyl, um, what levels of enforcement do we have in place or, or how can we assure that they're actually doing this? Well, I, I can tell you the only reason why they did the fentanyl is because it was a personal request from President Trump to President Xi. President Xi made a point of saying how difficult this would be for them, but they were going to do this. They have put through the laws, and uh, I'm, I'm very confident they're going to follow through on this, independent of any of our current trade negotiations. And it's a, a very important issue. It's killing, as you know, tens of yep. thousands of people. So just to clarify, so if we can't get the broader trade agreement, uh, your sus suspicion is that the fentanyl ban will still be in place and we will be able to enforce it. I have every expectation that that was not a conditional uh, ag agreement. Great. Um, and now kind of shifting to the Belt and Road Initiative a little bit. Um, just saw that China recently expanded into Italy with this. Um, I think there's, it's hard to figure out exactly what they're doing, candidly. I think the details kind of stay out of the public light. But um, last Congress, we passed, uh, I was not here, I'm a freshman, but we passed the Better Utilization of Investments Leading to Development, the BUILD Act. It was signed into law to help counteract China's emergence in new markets. Um, what more, what in addition can we do to push back on China's glowing, growing presence in the international development sphere? Well, I think the single best thing is we now have David Malpass, who is my undersecretary of head of the World Bank. I think but both at the IMF and at the World Bank, debt transparency are very important issues. And uh, I, I think the World Bank, combined with uh, our BUILD Act and other things, okay. can be a serious competitor to their belt and road. Okay. Uh, thank you. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. I yield myself five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. M Chairman Mnuchin, for being here. As I was uh, reviewing your statement in paragraph four of your statement, you note that opportunity zones are a key component of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. You also say that opportunity zones will offer capital gains tax relief for investments in businesses in distressed communities. So I would like to know, when is that gonna happen? How, much, how many dollars will be put into distressed communities? And how will you deal with to protect and assure us that we won't have gentrification uh, in these communities? So, uh when it's going to happen, it's, it's already started. People have already started creating Opportunity Zone funds. Uh, we've put out some regulations. We're putting out more regulations. We hope to get those out within the next few weeks. They're critical to create certainty. Where are some of those that are already in existence? Where, where, are, where are the dollars, what communities, what states? No, Do you I, have any in I was Columbus, saying, Ohio? I was saying the funds, the funds have started. So with the, the capital formation has started. Uh, many of the investments are, are waiting for the regulations, which I said we hope to have out in the next few weeks. Um, in regards to how much from commitments that I've heard people make, I could extrapolate. I think this is going to be over $100 billion. And uh, the issue of gentrification is something we're going to have to monitor very carefully and will be part of the reporting process. So you will be able to put in writing to me how we would make sure uh, that we don't take these minority or urban communities and then all of the dollars and change them where those individuals no longer have a place to live? Absolutely, and we look forward to working with you in your office on these issues. Uh, our objective is to create more jobs, more opportunities in, in those communities, not to change them. Okay, let me switch to another area that's of interest to me. And, and also in your testimony earlier, you used language to eliminate poverty and to talk about growth. I make that a direct connection. As you'll recall, when you were here uh, last year, I asked you about AMWE, Office of Minority Women and Inclusion. And, and you didn't do so well if I was grading you with a test score. Uh, you didn't know who your AMWE director was. You didn't have a lot of information to offer me about AMWE. So now can you tell me who your AMWE director is? 
Ken, and, and I, I want to thank you because uh, you did point this out to me, Lorraine Call. I meet with her on, on a monthly basis. Um, I go through the reports. Uh, I appreciate the importance of this, and thank you for bringing this to my attention last year. Well, let me also say, and I'd like to um, enter into the record that we requested the IG to take a look into your department's compliance with Section 342 of the Dodd-Frank Act. It didn't come up so well. When I read the report, the IG, uh, the Inspector General, found that the AMWI at your department will not likely be able to fulfill its responsibility at the same level as the other AMWIs in the other regulatory uh, offices because of insufficient staffing. I asked the same question to the new director of the CFPB last week, and it was a yes or no question. Will you put enough money in there to maintain Dr. Cole and to give her the appropriate staff as Section 342 uh, states? It's a yes or no. Because right now we know it's saying you only have two people. We know that's not enough. So are you going to put it up to a standard that I'm going to let you determine, but a standard that won't be embarrassing to you or cause an issue when you come before my DNI committee or back here? I, I will commit to you to make sure that she thinks she has enough staff. Okay. So the, the last question um, that I uh, have, are you aware of what the Inspector General's report stated? And do you have any idea of the diversity, if we're going to talk about growth and eliminating poverty, and we're going to go into distressed communities, do you have any idea of what your department looks like with women and minorities? And if not, you can send it to me uh, in writing. I I only have a, a few seconds. I'm going to reclaim my time because I'd like to take my last few seconds to recognize um, the Honorable Jesse Jackson being in our hearing and quite appropriate today when we're talking about national issues. So thank you, um, Reverend Jackson and my friend for being here. My time is up. I now recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hollingsworth, for five minutes. Good afternoon, it's great to see you again. I appreciate the time that you've invested with us thus far. Really, I, I know one of the things that we've worked on at last Congress, and we continue to work on this Congress, on both sides of the aisle, but especially on this side of the aisle, is developing an ecosystem in terms of financial regulation, financial oversight, where every bank of all different sizes can participate and hopefully grow successfully because ultimately them being able to grow successfully helps their communities grow successfully. And I certainly believe in an ecosystem where everyone competes on a level playing field and everyone has the opportunity to compete for good business. But I hope that you might be able to speak, especially in advance of tomorrow, about how it serves American interests, not only American corporate interests, but sometimes American government interests, and having super large banks headquartered here in the United States, having a financial system around the world that depends on the U.S. financial system as well, and how that empowers Treasury, and how it empowers the American consumer, and how it empowers American companies to have very large institutions that can serve the needs of very large American companies and serve the needs of American interest. And I wondered if you might be able to talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I think it is important, uh, I don't know about the word super large, mm -hmm. I would say, Large, well-capitalized U.S. financial institutions are critical to the U.S. economy mm -hmm. that have sufficient capital to be able to supply businesses, both large and small, right. uh, and, and do global business. It's, it's very important to the U.S. economy. Right. And as you talked about earlier with regard to trade, Indiana has a very high percentage of its state's GDP is dependent on trade. And ever more important, U.S. companies are competing, selling, importing, exporting abroad. And it's really important that we have institutions that can do that kind of cross-border work. And frankly, in their absence, other institutions would step in and do that work. And perhaps they might be not headquartered in the United States. And so it continues to be really important to me to ensure that we have an ecosystem where our large institutions can compete as well. And I wondered if you might also talk a little bit about the importance of even foreign-owned banks that operate and invest right here in the United States and how they have a role to play in that financial services ecosystem as well. Yeah, we, we encourage a system where foreign banks can invest in the U.S. We want to make sure that they're properly regulated, they're right. properly capitalized. Right. But like any other type of investment, we encourage 
uh, foreign companies or foreign individuals to invest in the United States. Right. And as you say, properly regulated and properly capitalized, I know that one of the concerning issues that we've had a few times that's come up here is just making sure that there is some parity between the two, right? We don't want our foreign institutions to be advantaged in some way or disadvantaged in some way. We want them to be thoughtfully regulated, thoughtfully capitalized, such that they can compete on that level playing field with U.S. firms, so that hopefully the American consumer and American companies that are seeking to use them, right, will fi face a competitive environment where they can get the best possible deal, right? That is correct, a level playing field. Right. Well, I'm glad to hear that. So coming back to, I just want to touch on one other topic. It is important, right, as a part of Treasury's work, the sanctions, right, the financial restrictions that Treasury does is an important aspect of that. And much of the strength of that comes from our being a reserve currency, right, and the U.S. financial system being such a large part of the global financial system. And I wondered if you might talk about what threats there might be um, to that system and the architecture of that system coming from some of our large counterpart countries. Well, uh, it is a tremendous benefit for us to be the reserve currency of the world, and it's a tremendous responsibility. And that's why when we look at sanctions, we have to take into lots of different issues and lots of considerations, but there's no question sanctions are effective because we are the reserve currency of the world. Right. And for the U.S. financial system, it is, it is, it is a, a utmost importance us maintaining that status. Right. And those things, those policy threats that might imperil us being the reserve currency, imperil our financial system, restrict the ability of our financial system to reach and compete globally, I mean, those might adversely impact in the long run the efficacy of these sanctions and the United States being a leader in being able to conduct those operations around the world, right? It would, and our ability to raise capital all over the world. Right. Certainly, a, there are many challenges, but that's an important one I want that I think is frequently lost, that our, the efficacy of these sanctions programs depends on us continuing to be a capital market, right, continue to be a financial services industry that competes around the world and is ever large presence around the world. So, They're intricately linked, and I'm glad you've pointed that out. Right. Thank you for the time today. I'll yield back. The gentleman from Washington, Mr. Heck, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd like to quickly follow up on some of the line of questioning of my friends, Mr. Stivers and Mr. Hisinga, regarding the Export-Import Bank. First, to correct the record, bank was not as indicated established in 1945. It was established in 1934. It's celebrating its 85th year, but I quibble. <laughs> the larger point, however, I'd like to correct is the representation that it exists only to assist small businesses. In fact, a simple reading of the history of the bank over 85 years is that it, it assists with export credit in three areas where the market is imperfect. The market is indeed imperfect in helping small businesses stand up sales to foreign countries. It's also imperfect in its sales to countries that are developing because banks don't have international ability necessarily to collect within developing certain developing countries. And thirdly, Banks are disinclined to engage in long-term financing for long-lived large dollar items. So think massive earth-moving equipment by Caterpillar sold to some nation that's building highways. <clears throat> and it, it, it's in this regard that I think it's really important to clarify that even though Caterpillar, as an example, might be a very large business, Caterpillar's supply chain is made up of thousands and thousands of small businesses who are hurt by the fact that the bank does not have a quorum and therefore cannot approve deals above $10 million. So simply put, would you acknowledge that small businesses are being hurt by the absence of a quorum uh, on the Export-Import Bank? I, I, I would, and the, the $10 million threshold is an awfully low threshold. So I mean, I think we would agree that there are lots of small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and as you've pointed out, big businesses do employ people with small businesses, and the purpose was not to displace private capital, but as you've pointed out, to assist where there is not private lending to facilitate trade. Mr. Secretary, do you have any idea how much China's various export credit authorities have issued in loan guarantees or loans in the last two years? It's enormous and multiples, multiples of anything we would do no matter what we ended up doing with the export-import. Would it surprise you to learn that they have issued 
uh, more credit in the last two years than our Export-Import Bank has in its entire 85-year history? That would not surprise me. So would you acknowledge that in this era where China is emerging is clearly uh, a highly competitive long-term strategic competitor that utilizes whole-of-government means to achieve their uh, purposes, that we would be well served by having a fully functioning Export-Import Bank as one of the arrows in our quiver in which to compete with them? I, I can tell you that the President and I and others in the administration think this is very important and I would hope whatever issues there are we can figure this out on a bipartisan basis and whatever reforms. It, it is important from an economic standpoint to get the Inks in bank back open and that means loans above 10 million. You have any idea why we call it the Export-Import Bank when it doesn't do any import business whatsoever? I'm sorry, what was that? Do you have any idea why we call it the Export-Import Bank when it doesn't do any import business whatsoever? I don't know the history of that. So I want to shift to the proposal by the administration to reform uh, the government-sponsored enterprise. The President's obviously directed you and Secretary Carson to come forth with a plan to reform uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and also laid down some benchmarks by which that proposal would be measured. I'd like to respectfully suggest the addition of two uh, more benchmarks. The first is predicated on the clear evidence that we have a shortage of homes in this country. As I indicated at an earlier subcommittee meeting, in the 1970s we built 12,000 units for every million people in America and now we're building 4,000 for every million. Clearly we have a shortage that has been documented to be at least 1.5 million. And part of the solution to that, because we assess that construction financing sometimes gets pinched, not necessarily, but sometimes consumer access to credit, but construction financing gets pinched, would you support at least the current level of support by the GSEs of construction financing? And secondly, as we, or if we stand up a new GSE, would you commit to ensuring that smaller banks and credit unions have a means of laying off their mortgages so that they can compete effectively with larger banks who can create their own securitization market? Would you support those two bench benchmarks? Well, I can assure you on this, the second benchmark, I, I completely support that and want to make sure there's a fair and level playing field. On the first benchmark, I'm not an expert enough on this, but we will reach out to your office and as we as we put together a proposal, we will absolutely take into account your ideas. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I yield back. Gentlemen's time is up. The, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stow, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, for Secretary Muge, and for being here. Uh, first question, kind of the role of large banks uh, in our economy. The U.S. has large and dynamic economy, producing many, many uh, globally successful companies, businesses, uh, are world leaders in manufacturing, services, technology, consumer goods. Uh, they create opportunities for workers, families, uh, and downstream suppliers. I experienced firsthand uh, the impact that this can have in manufacturing in southeast Wisconsin, on successful American business generating jobs, sustaining communities, uh, and investing in innovation. Uh, as you know, the, the U.S. is home to several large financial institutions that, among other things, provide the critical services to American companies engaged in global commerce uh, that fulfill an important role in our financial system. As I look at it, as the world's top 10 largest banks, four are Chinese, uh, several others are European, uh, and by my count, only a couple are US-based. Uh, does this matter? And what would happen to our economy if large, globally competitive banks are placed at a competitive disadvantage uh, to our foreign banks? I think it would be a very significant problem for the U.S. economy. And in particular, as, as it relates to exports in the United States? As it relates to everything, be, being competitive. That ha having strong, well-capitalized, <coughs> leading banks are very important to the structure of our overall economy and, our, and us being competitive throughout the world. Thank you. I, I'm going to shift tactics to illicit finance and, and human trafficking, uh, which is something that's important to me. Uh, according to the latest estimates, uh, more than 40 million people around the world uh, are subjected to, to human trafficking. Men are, many are trapped in forced labor, uh, are sexually exploited. Uh, research estimates that 25% of these people are children, 75% uh, are women and girls. 
Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible crime, and regardless of party geography, we gotta be committed uh, to stopping this. Uh, but unfortunately, it's also big business, and that means we need to target uh, the financial crimes associated uh, with this uh, and the ill-gotten profits uh, from human trafficking, which is why I introduced a bill earlier today uh, that would require our government to hold countries accountable to turn a blind eye to illicit, illicit financial activity uh, with regards to human trafficking. What can the Treasury Department uh, do to prevent human trafficking and their associates from abusing the U.S. financial system uh, to facilitate their crimes? Well, we have uh, pr the proper intelligence in working with the State Department. We have many sanctions authorities that we can utilize and we go after for these issues. And I'm not familiar with your bill, but we look forward to, to learning about it. I appreciate you taking the time today. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Guam, Mr. San Nicholas, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being with us this afternoon. I wanted to have a conversation about the earned income tax credit and uh, how it uh, creates a unique liability for the Treasury. The um, earned income tax credit, uh, for an EITC taxpayer, the difference between their income tax refund and their income tax withholdings is a Treasury liability. Is that correct? I believe that is the case, but now we're, now we're into an accounting issue. Right, right. Ba basically, they earn X amount, X amount is withheld. If the refund exceeds what's withheld, that's actually a treasury liability that the treasury has to pay out. Is that correct? I, I want to make sure I'm following your, your, your technical issue. There, there are withholding taxes, there are, is the EITC, right. okay? I think what you're saying is definitionally, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure I can check. I don't believe we record that as a liability on our books and records, but I'll check that and get back to you. Well, what I mean by liability is that the treasurer is, is responsible for paying out the earned income tax credit if there is no withholding sufficient to pay it to fund it. The treasury is responsible for paying out the EITC, that is correct. Does the treasury fund this liability by diverting funds from ed education, health, or public safety? The treasury funds everything okay, on a general basis. There's no specific allocations from one program to any other program. And so, again, just to reiterate, the Treasury is responsible for funding the earned income tax credit. Well, the Treasury is responsible for dispersing the earned income tax credit. The U.S. government is responsible for funding it. Well, I'm glad we have this on the record, uh, Mr. Secretary, because uh, I'm a delegate from Guam, and uh, since 2008, Guam has been absorbing 100% of the earned income tax credit uh, payouts that uh, have been filed from our taxpayers in the territory. And uh, this sum has actually ballooned to account for over 50% of the annual set aside that we have for uh, tax refunds altogether. And so uh, what I'm really hoping, especially with tax season in full gear, is that um, we can have the Treasury uh, work with the Guam Department of Revenue and Taxation to figure out what the earned income tax credit amounts the Treasury should be paying for the taxpayers on Guam who are claiming this credit. And I want to just um, put on the record also, Mr. Secretary, that this is not something new. The Treasury has for years already been paying out the additional child tax credit on Guam. And so in order for us to be consistent with the Treasury funding the ACTC, uh, I, I humbly ask the Treasury also do its part to fund the EITC on Guam. And uh, this, is, this is very critical, Mr. Secretary, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of them is the fact that um, with poverty rates so high on Guam, uh, the diversion of uh, general fund coffers in the territory of Guam to fund the EITC payouts uh, impacts education and it impacts health and it impacts public safety. And those diversions also result in uh, deficits um, to the territory because we're having to pull uh, other tax resources that would have otherwise been used to meet our appropriations projections. And so I think that um, it's, the, the time has come for us to have the conversation of not only having the Treasury fund the EITC on Guam going forward, but I would deeply uh, appreciate if the Treasury can also work with the government of Guam to reconcile all of the earned income tax credits that have been paid out since 2008 so we can recover those funds because it has resulted in deficits, it has resulted in debt, it has resulted in um, deferred maintenance. 
we don't even have textbooks in our, in our public schools that are within the, uh, the reasonable seven-year age of the textbooks. There's so many fund diversions going on in the territory, and this EITC liability of $56 million a year uh, accounts for a significant chunk of that. So um, I appreciate your, um, your forthrightness in, in, um, in answering my questions with respect to who's responsible for paying that. And uh, I look forward to the Treasury working with the Territory of Guam to making the territory whole. And, and let me just comment, uh, I, I am aware of Guam has some highly technical tax issues. I've actually met with the governor last time he was here with the Office of Tax Policy. We'd be happy for you to come in also on this. So please follow up with my office on these specific issues. I, I know there's this and a bunch of other technical issues we've been trying to help on. I, I just want to zero in on this. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I yield back, Mr. Chair. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Mr. Secretary, in the last Congress, I was pleased to chair the subcommittee that oversaw the development of the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act, or FIRMA. I appreciate your support of that effort. I later served on the conference committee that negotiated the FIRMA provisions that the President signed into law. And this committee's leadership has been united in its prioritization of FIRMA rulemaking, and I'd like for unanimous consent to enter into, into the record a letter that, you, that, uh, that um, uh, I co-signed with Chairwoman Waters, former Chairman Henserling, and the former uh, subcommittee ranking member Gwen Moore detailing congressional intent behind some of FIRMA's provisions. Without objection. Thank you. And, and Mr. Secretary, I have a few questions for you on, on the status of the current rulemaking process. FIRMA requires CFIUS to narrow its scope for certain transactions to particular cu countries. While CFIUS has some discretion on which countries it targets, clearly Congress wanted to see China taken seriously. How will you go about ensuring that China and other bad actors are the focus of the rulemaking and not U.S. allies such as Canada, Japan, Israel, and our partners in Europe? Well, first of all, we, we're very much supportive of the legislation. Thank you. This is a priority of ours, uh, executing it. Um, I can assure you we're not just focused on China. We're focused on other countries as well, and uh, we look forward to working with you. I think the regulations will be clear as we roll this out, the pilot and the full time, that uh, we want to encourage investment. We don't want to discourage investment, but this is about protecting national security interests. Great, and thank you for uh, your 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 balancing uh, those interests, including uh, maintaining an open investment climate. Um, I was pleased to see that the President's budget contained significantly more resources for CFIUS operations. Uh, CFIUS is a national security function and Congress should fund it appropriately. Does the President's expanded request to Congress mean that you currently don't see a need to impose filing fees? Uh, no, we, we anticipate there will be filing fees as well. Well, uh, with it, but but nothing, nothing more than what is contemplated in the in the in firma. Not nothing that's. I, I believe it's in our budget. Uh, it takes into account the new filing fees, but we'll follow up with your office on it. Thank you. I think I think you'll find the filing fees will will be reasonable. Thank you. And Mr. Secretary, I was encouraged to see uh, the administration announce its designation of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a foreign terrorist organization. Uh, the IRGC and the Quds Force have been responsible for the deaths of numerous Americans abroad, uh, and we're even behind the planning of an attempted bombing attack right here in our nation's capital. In what ways will this designation restrict IRGC financial activity that previous executive orders and the Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act did not, and what role will Treasury have in these restrictions? Well, Treasury has been very involved with the State Department on this in the interagency basis. It's something that we think is very important. Um, from a financial standpoint, we've already had financial sanctions in place. This puts in other restrictions to restrict people both in entering the country and doing business and other things. So this is, this is even stronger sanctions that well, will be in place. I applaud the administration's designation, and, and I know Treasury is going to have an important role to play in imp implementation. Finally, um, you had uh, mentioned your interest in commenting on the leveraged loan uh, issue. Obviously, leveraged lending is increasing. 
Uh, 75 percent, I think, is estimated uh, through non-bank firms. But as I understand it, nearly 70 percent of U.S. companies are non-investment grade. And aren't leveraged loans simply loans to well-known non-investment grade companies like Dell, American Airlines, Burger King, Cablevision, Sprint, Hilton Hotels, that permit these companies to grow, thrive, and hire American workers? And if these loans were shut off, wouldn't it be very bad for the companies and their employees along with the broader U.S. economy? That's true. Leverage lending is a very important part of the economy. We are working at FSOC and studying the leverage lending issue just because people have raised this to make sure there are no problems, uh, but it is something, something we're on top of. And I know you recognize that if the economy does have a downturn, prices will drop and certain types of high yield debt will be difficult to refinance. But um, uh, in a November uh, 2018 speech referring to elevated business bankruptcies and outsized losses, uh, Fed Chairman Powell said such losses are unlikely to pose a threat to the safety and soundness of institutions at the core of the system and are likely to fall on investment vehicles like CLOs with stable funding that present little threat of damaging fire sales. Given that CLOs pr provide long-term capital not subject to the short-term redemptions or outflows we've seen in retail and institutional credit products, do you believe, unlike some of the current re rhetoric in Washington today, that CLOs can represent a vital source of liquidity to the, to the below investment grade companies? I do indeed, and that's one of the reasons we're comfortable. A lot of the capital has moved out of the banking, the regulated banking sector, into CLOs, which are permanent capital vehicles. Right, and they perform very well over their 30-year history, including during the financial crisis. Gentlemen's time back. is up. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Excuse Kasson, me. is uh, recognized for five minutes. Madam Chair, excuse me for one second. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but we had an agreement that I was going to leave here at 5 o'clock. I have a very significant bilat. It would be embarrassing. Now, I will tell you, in the last six years, there's never been a Secretary of Treasury who sat for more than three hours and 15 minutes. So uh, I, as a courtesy, am happy to stay till 5.15, but it would be very embarrassing to a foreign government if this committee expected me to not show up for that meeting. Mr. Secretary, I thank you for that, but if we still have members here with questions, and we have members on both sides who too have uh, prepared for these questions, would you be willing to come back to the committee in May? I'd always be willing to come back to the committee. I, I look uh, forward to working with Chairwoman Waters on an, an appropriate time to make so sure. So you would commit committee. to coming back in May? Absolutely. I want to make sure the committee always has time to answer all their questions. Okay. Thank you. If I am going to come back, though, I would, I would propose that we could break so I'm not late for this meeting. And, and if we continue and stop at your deadline, uh, would, if we need more than one, hitting, one hearing, would you commit to coming back at least twice? I, I would do what previous secretaries have done. I can't see why it's not sufficient to come back. But again, as opposed to trying to negotiate this in this format. I have every aspect. I'd like to have a good working relationship with the committee, and uh, I look forward to answering all your questions. Thank you. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, is would, recognized uh, Madam for Chair. five minutes. Uh, Madam Chair, thank, thank it, you, Madam. It, Madam Chair uh, inquiry of the Chair. Um, at, this, at this point, there are equal numbers of questions asked by Republicans and Democrats. So if, if we're going to adjourn in five minutes, and we need to divide this remaining time between Republicans and Democrats, just to be fair, under our committee rules. I have no problem. I have no problem. We've been doing that the entire time, going from Democrats. It's 510, and so five more minutes is taken, and the secretary has to leave in five minutes. So then that would be the un question un will go to the secretary to stay for one Democrat and one Republican. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, is recognized for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mnuchin. I will try to be quick to respect your time. Um, would you support a United States return to the gold standard? I would not. <laughs> Good. Um, do you agree with the President's recent call for a renewal of quantitative easing? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Do you, do you agree with the President's recent suggestions that we should renew quantitative easing? Uh, in, in my role as Treasury Secretary, it would be inappropriate for me to make specific comments on what the Federal Reserve should or shouldn't do. Um, okay. Uh, from 
significantly expanded deficit spending to significantly expanded borrowing. We are pursuing a very expansionary policy since the 2015 tax cuts in spite of rising GDP and falling unemployment. As a general matter, do you support the, the pro rather than counter cyclical fiscal policy we've been pursuing relative to the larger economy? Um, I don't think you can put all fiscal policy the same. I support the tax cuts and I stand by, I think this will create growth that will pay for it. But we also had significant government spending on top of that and we've got to be careful because we can't spend the money twice. Um, okay, the reason for my question is that, that I think this morning the IMF cut the, the global gro growth outlook to the lowest level since the crisis. Domestically, we're seeing an inversion of the, from the three months of the 10-year Treasury bonds, we're looking at an inverted yield, yield curve. How concerned should we be that we are, are approaching the next downturn? Uh, first of all, there's no question that growth outside of the United States, whether it be in Europe or China, has slowed significantly. As it relates to the inverted yield curve, I am not particularly concerned about the inverted yield curve at all. And from everything we see, uh, we see for the next two years still very strong, robust e U.S. growth. Um, well, I certainly hope you're right. Um, I think I've yet to see a downturn that people predicted from the, uh, at the right moment. If we would, we'd all be wealthy by now. Um, if it comes, here's my concern. In the, in the last downturn, we had the tremendous good fortune to have exceptionally competent, policy-driven technocrats at the helm, from Mr. Bernanke to Mr. Paulson, Mr. Geithner. These men were uniquely suited to the moment, and I think we can second-guess them, but they did pretty well in the circumstances. Um, President Trump has, to put it mildly, not proven himself capable of attracting or retaining people of that caliber. And I want to be clear, I do not put you in that category. You're, you're an extremely smart guy. Your resume qualifies you for this. But I do have real concerns, given some of his recent suggested nominees to, um, to various Federal Reserve posts who might have answered some of these questions differently than you have, that when the next downturn comes, we are not going to have people with the skills necessary to handle it, and certainly without the trust of the markets that that prior generation had. Now, I'm not going to ask you whether you agree with that. It would be an awkward question for you. I suspect, given your background, you may share some of those concerns at night. Um, my question for you as the Congress, given that potential and given your experience and wisdom, how would you advise we hedge against that future risk? Well, I don't agree with you at all. Um, I have a lot of confidence in the economic team that we have, whether it's uh, uh, with the regulators or whether it's uh, 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 in, in the Commerce Department, in the Trade Department, uh, Larry Kudlow in the White House, I think we have as robust an economic team as we've had in previous areas, and I'm glad to hear you like these previous people. I worked for Secretary Paulson for a long period of time and uh, understand that. Well, I, I guess my concern is as much, uh, I mean, the President keeps sycophants and family members around him. There's a lot of turnover in the rest, and I am as concerned about the trust that financial markets will have for those individuals putting policy first as their basic skills. And that's the concern that I feel we have to hedge against. Is, that a, is there well, a question I'm supposed um, to answer on that? I, I, think with, I think with respect to your tight time, I will, I will yield back the balance of my time. Who's next, please? The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Secretary, thank you. I'm going to be very conscientious of your time. Even though I'm a, a member of Congress, I'm also an American citizen, and I think it's very important that we, we put the best light of our nation um, with the rest of the world, especially with foreign leaders. So I've got a whole suite of questions. I'm just going to narrow it down to one. Um, it's, uh, uh, regarding NARA, you know, four years ago we passed the National Association of Registered Agents and Brokers, was signed into law, and it's going to be stood up at the Treasury Department, but what's holding it back is that um, we haven't nominated a board of directors yet to be con uh, confirmed by the Senate. They haven't been appointed. I'm leading a 
a bipartisan uh, bicameral letter to the president. Several have signed on to it, uh, expressing the urgency to go ahead and move forward. I know that you've submitted some names. My question, can you please pass along to the president the urgency of getting this moving forward? Will do. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Secretary, if I may, uh, you had indicated that you would like to have a press conference uh, in this room following. No, I, I'm, I'm going to cancel that. I don't have time for that. So I'm uh, not Well, doing that's what I was going to ask you if you would, uh, instead of having the press conference uh, continue uh, with those uh, members who have been waiting here for so long. Uh, uh, and I think what I thought I originally heard was 5.30 rather than 5.15. So is it possible you could give us another 15 minutes to get to no, these I, I have a foreign leader waiting in my office at 5.30, okay? I agreed to stay longer. It, it will be embarrassing if I keep this person waiting for a long period of time. I wasn't going to have a press conference. I was going to have a short press gaggle. I'm not going to do that. And I've assured you I'm happy to come back here and answer more of your questions. I respect the committee, and we want to have a good working relationship with you. So I, 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 I hope you'll understand I'm already going to be late to um, my 530 meeting. I do understand. We're late all the time, unfortunately. We are all pressed for time, and I do get it. Uh, however, uh, I think I indicated early on uh, that we would request or require uh, that you come back at least two more times in the month of May. Is that something you're agreeing to? No, Ma Madam Chair, I find this to be, you know, I, I have here every single time Jack Lew and other people came here. There's never been anybody that's been here more than three hours and 15 minutes. I've sat here for over three hours and 15 minutes. I've told you I'll come back. I, I just don't believe we're sitting here negotiating when I come back. We'll follow up with your office. How long would you like me to come back for next time? I've told you I'll accommodate you. I appreciate that, and I appreciate your uh, reminding us of the length of time other uh, secretaries have been here. This is a new way, and it's a new day, okay, well, and it's a new chair, okay, and well, I have the gavel at this point. If you wish to leave, you may. Uh, can you clarify that for me? Yes, clarify is so, this. So if I'm you dismissed. wish to leave, you may. Okay, so we're, we're, you're, we're dismissed, is that correct? If you wish to leave, you may leave. I don't understand what you're saying. You're wasting you have your the, time. Don't rem remember you have a, a foreign dignitary in your office. I, I would just say that the previous pre when the Republicans, they did not treat the Secretary of the Treasury this way. So if, if this is the way you want to treat me, then I'll rethink whether I voluntarily come back here to testify, which I've offered to do. Um, Mr. Secretary, I want you to know that no other secretary has ever told us the day before that they were going to limit their time in the way that you're doing. So if you want to use them as examples, you have acted differently than they have acted. And as, about, as I have said, if you wish to leave, you may. If you'd wish to keep me here so that I don't have my important meeting, and continue to grill me, then we can do that. I will cancel my meeting and I will not be back here. I will be very clear if that's the way you'd like to have this relationship. Thank you. The gentleman, the secretary has agreed to stay to hear all of the rest of the members. Okay, Please so just cancel let's your be clear meeting to the press. and I'm respect our time. I, I am Who is next on the list? My foreign meeting. You're, you're instructing me to stay here and I should cancel. No, you just board. made me an offer. No, I didn't make you an you offer. You made me let's an offer that I accepted. I, I did not make well, you an offer. Just let's be clear. Well, you're you, instructing me, you are ordering me to stay here. No, Do I'm not either? ordering you. I'm responding. Okay. I said you may leave anytime you want. And you said, okay, if that's what you want to do, I'll cancel my appointment and I'll stay here. So I'm responding to your request. If that's what you that's want to do. That's not what I want to do. I told you. What would you like to do? What I've told you is I thought it was respectful that you'd let me leave at 5.15. You are which free is to leave anytime you want. Time. You okay, may go well then, uh, anytime please. you want. Please dismiss everybody. I believe you're supposed to take the gravel and, and bang it. That's Please do not instruct me as to how I'm to conduct this committee. Please, gentle lady, the time belongs to the chair. Who's next? 
The gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'm not sure the Secretary has the attention right now. Mr. Mr. Secretary. Okay, so my understanding, I've just been advised that I'm under no obligation to stay. I'm here voluntarily. I will leave at 5.30, which is gonna make me already 20 minutes late. So uh, I'm happy to listen for another 10 minutes and then, and then I will be Thank leaving. you, Ms. Would you proceed? And uh, I, I've withdrawn my offer to voluntarily come back. We can follow up if that's appropriate or not. You may choose to do whatever you want. Ms. Dean, it is your time now. Please proceed. Thank you for restoring the clock also. Mr. Secretary, how do you do? Good. Um, and I, I'm disappointed to hear you threaten not to come back. That isn't uh, really what we hope of our cabinet officials in this administration or any other administration. Uh, so thank you for staying on. Uh, who was who uh, the foreign dignitary that you were meeting with? Uh, I, I am meeting with a very senior person from Bahrain that is here to talk about national security issues and sanctions. Thank you. Um, maybe you heard this, but last week, NATO General Secretary was before a joint session uh, of, uh, of Congress, uh, and he gave a beautiful, staring speech. His concerns regarding Russia were the following. In 2014, Russia illegally annexed Crimea, the first time in Europe that one country has taken part of another by force since World War II. He said that we see, this is quote, a pattern of Russian behavior, including a massive military buildup from the Arctic to the Mediterranean, from the Black Sea to the Baltic, the use of military grade nerve agent in the United Kingdom, support for Assad's murderous regime in Syria, consistent cyber attacks on NATO allies and partners, targeting everything from parliament grids, uh, power grids, sophisticated disinformation campaigns, and attempts to interfere in democracy itself. Did you have a chance to hear his speech? I, I didn't, but at your recommendation, I will get a copy of it and read it. it, it it's beautiful. Uh, and he's, he prefaced it and ended it with, it's good to have friends. And he was really recalling the history of NATO and the partnership of 70 years among nations there. And he ended it with, it's good to have friends. In the middle, he implied, uh, or at least I inferred, uh, but it's also good to know who your friends are not uh, in this world. And with that history of what has been going on, uh, with Russia aggression, uh, I, I'm puzzled how it was that you decided to delist three sanctioned Russian companies with, I guess, majority ownership by Deripaska. What was your decision for delisting them from sanctions? Sure. Well, th thank you for raising that because it's a it's a very important issue. Uh, first of all, uh, the important issue is we decided to sanction the companies, and I think in particular you're talking about Rusal and the related entities. They were all uh, a, a group of entities. Um, and we did that under the, the various different authorities that we had. Why did you delist the, them? I just, I don't want to go the whole history. Why did you delist them? We delisted them because the company approached us, not the oligarch, the company approached us. Uh, a large group of people, including our career people, negotiated an agreement. Majority uh, control by the oligarch. And, and, and it's no longer majority controlled by him. He now has what percentage ownership? He has a, uh, he and related entities have a 45% uh, ownership and a 35% vote. And he shed some ownership have, to whom? Uh, various different entities. Who? Uh, again, I'm happy to. Any family members? Uh, Any related members? Again, if you're referring to there were shares transferred to his children pursuant to a divorce decree that he was legally bound to do. So uh, he retains 45% ownership. His children got other shares. So likely uh, among the family, they have more than a majority of ownership. No, no, they so, don't have a, more than a majority in the family. But we don't know that for sure. Are you able to provide us that full detailing? Uh, I, I believe on a confidential basis, we'd be more than happy to give you all those details. Okay. Um, speaking of conflicts of interest, what, when did you take the position of secretary? I believe it was February 13th. Of 2017. That is correct. And, and you uh, sold uh, a company that you owned uh, to your then fiance, now wife. Is that correct? That's correct. And that was fully approved by the ethics department at Treasury. And that took place when? Uh, I, I don't have the exact date, but I can... After you follow. assumed the secretary. Yeah, but, but that was, I was in my ethics agreement. I was given a certain amount of time to sell assets. That's, that was appropriate, which I 
I did. And, and, but you thought it appropriate to sell to your fiance now wife? That would clear you of any conflict of interest? Uh, again, just to be clear, okay, uh, that transaction was fully vetted and fully approved and consistent with the, the ethics. What questions agreement. did you ask of ethics counsel surrounding that transaction? Uh, I asked extensive questions both internally to our designated ethics advisor as well as outside counsel I had. I wanted to make sure I was fully in compliance. Because you were concerned about a conflict of interest or the appearance of a conflict no, of no, interest? No, not because I was concerned with a, I was never concerned about a conflict of interest. Quite frankly, I don't think I should have had to sold, sell it, but I agreed to comply with what was the decision of, of the OGE. Why did they tell you you needed to sell it? I, I, I don't know. It, you took, again, you took on that transaction, divested yourself of the ownership, yeah, I was although your wife owns it, and you don't know why they recommended that that was what you needed to do? Uh, again, I want to just be clear. I divested every, virtually every single asset that I owned. Uh, and uh, again, as part of the agreement I entered into, I agreed to sell the asset. I was fully compliant when I sold it to my fiance. I, I just see a strange parallel here. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, is recognized for the rest of the time between now and 5.30 when the secretary will be leaving. Thank you, Secretary Mnuchin, for uh, being with us today and for being so generous with your time. I'd like to yield 30 seconds of my time to Mr. King. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Secretary, in respect to your time, I will just take five seconds to say I will submit a written question to you, if, if okay with you, uh, regarding CFIUS and China. And with that, I yield back to the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. King. The FSOC annual report has previously stated that the Council reaffirms its view that housing finance reform legislation is needed to create a more sustainable system. The White House recently issued a memo, as you know, on housing finance reform on March 29th with a number of uh, uh, outlining a number of initiatives. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I understand you cannot go into the weeds too much and tell me more about Treasury's views at a high level of what housing reform should look like, uh, but, but could you give me some guidance as to what you believe and Treasury believes housing reform should look like? Uh, absolutely, and this is an area I've been involved with for over 30 years. Um, it's something I've talked about, and I believe that it should be twofold. So one is it relates to the GSEs. We should have a system where uh, taxpayers are not at risk. So we want a robust system where people can access mortgage capital, 30-year mortgages, but not put uh, taxpayers at risk. And the reason why we're focused on housing reform and not just GSE reform is we want to make sure that we don't take the risk out of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and put it all at FHA and transfer it to, uh, to taxpayers in, in another bucket. So this is something I really hope we can work on a bipartisan basis. I've said my first choice is to do legislation with Congress and I hope we can do something quickly this year. Thank you. I appreciate your interest in making housing finance reform a priority. While the last administration did express some interest in the issue, they did not provide the leadership necessary to get reform over the finish line, and your leadership makes me optimistic that this will get done. In the interest of time, Madam Chair, I ask unanimous consent to submit to the record a list of previous appearances by Treasury secretaries along with the time that they gave Without objection, such is the order. Thank you I very much. Yield the balance. Mr. Secretary, uh, thank you for staying until 5.30. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions to the chair, which will be forwarded to the secretary for his response. Um, and I ask the secretary to please respond as promptly as you're able. And I expect the secretary to honor our invitation to return so that the rest of these members will have an opportunity to pursue their questions. So without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous material to the chair for inclusion in this record. This committee is adjourned. Thank you, and I look forward to being back in May. We'll work on a date. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.